The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time, without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code OURGAME to get yourself 10% off. Michael Verney, we're back. We're always back. We're never to uh, wait for too long, are we? So, uh, massive weekend. I mean, there's Leinster semi-finals, Munster semi-finals. All of a sudden, it feels like once this weekend is over, an awful lot of the hurling season is done. Yeah, there's so much this weekend to get through, even in the lower tiers. Um, one thing that struck me, looking at the bamboo video, who would have thought that John Conlon would be ma marshalling into the fence at the other end of the pitch and not banging in goals as well? So the bamboo obviously works uh, as well, either end of the pitch. But uh, so many games to get through. To, like Any weekend you have four provincial semi-finals like and four big juicy games all with like different subplots yeah this is this is probably the weekend of the, the weekend of the year in terms of hurling realistically yeah you couldn't bet it with a stick like Galway Dublin Kilkenny Wexford Limerick Cork tip player a lot of a lot of great rivalries from over the years or modern sort of rivalries like Galway and Dublin have had a couple of nice games over the last few years think back to the 2013 uh, semi-final between the two of them in Leinster at Croke Park when Dublin sorry that was actually a Leinster final made a big breakthrough there obviously a couple of years ago that massive Leinster round robin final game that ended up being a knockout clash at Parnell Park that was absolutely brilliant Kilkenny Wexford I mean Davy Cody you couldn't beat that Limerick Cork story rivalry Tipperary Clare I grew up as a young lad in the 90s and uh, by God did I hate Clare so <laughs> you know I mean you always have that in the back of your mind you know the rivalry that you grew up with, it, it, it kind of never fully goes away, that disdain for certain teams. You probably have a disdain for a few teams from when you were a young lad. Uh, it would have been Clare, 95 and, and 98, the, the heartbreak, uh, the heartbreak aim and half goal in 95. And then uh, I think it was my, my cousin was getting married, so I missed the, the Jimmy Cooney game. And I remember just being at the wedding, watching it, and everyone was just complete silence. Anyone on the office side, complete silence. And then obviously with the greatest... Probably the greatest offly day in Turlestown six days later. Uh, but that one would that one would definitely all, always stick with me. I always I always say it was regret that Tipperary weren't going well when Offley were going really well. Because geez, there would have been some crack if Tip and Offley had met in all Ireland semi finals or finals. Just the, the proximity, how 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 close they are, it, that would have been that would have been brilliant. But definitely it's probably probably clear for me, even though it's over twenty years ago at this stage. Yeah, so get your comments in. We always love getting them in and plenty of good talking points from our viewers. Sometimes they know a little bit more than we might know. That's a that's, fact, that's yeah, really definitely, fair. yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're brought to you by Bam the Bamboo Hurley from Torpy. Also, if you want to get this on audio podcast, uh, go to patreon.com forward slash our game, a fiver a month to help uh, support the channel. And also, if you want your club to, to raise thousands of euros um, in a fundraiser this summer or later in the year, contact events at ourgame.ie and we'll get one going for you. So um, you were, uh, do you know what, actually, I want to bring up a talking point about referees because um, I have some stats here and we can talk about the change in how referees have uh, officiated games in recent times. But look, look at some of the disparity here. I'm sure our viewers out there will have plenty of thoughts on this as well. But at the top end of the scale from the two, two games that Sean Stack, the Dublin referee, has done in the league, 80 frees from two games. Now, that's 40 per game. At the bottom end of the scale, Thomas Walsh and, you know, Sean Clear, Fergal Horgan, they in total between two games give away 43, 44 and 45 frees. So, I mean, we, I don't actually have the breakdown of what games it's each from the league game, Shane, is it? This yeah? is from the league games. And I suppose there was probably a big change in how ga games were being refereed after maybe John Kiley spoke publicly after the Galway game and talking about, you know, you know, what happened over the last several months? How did Hurland change so much? He wasn't sort of informed about it, which, of course, none of us were. And we were all wondering where exactly is Hurland going with this? But those are some fairly stark figures between the top and bottom end. I'll just bring it up while you while you reply. Yeah, I tell you what, Shane, the thing that stands out to me most there is that Cotton McAllister is number two, uh, who is actually gen generally my favourite referee because he's not whistle-happy at all. He obviously refereed that, that Westmead-Waterford game where there was... Was there the guts of 50 frees in that game? And that's someone 
that's someone who's going against his natural natural instincts of letting the game flow. Uh, like as a defender, Cotton McAllister is generally like a brilliant referee. He will he will generally let things go. He, he was no genuinely like when we played Limerick in in 08 in that qualifier, and I was Mark and Andrew Shocknessy, and he was he would he'd let you away. He would let you away with the the pulling and dragging unless it was very very clearly visible. So I think that's evidence. Him being number two and having such a high free count is evidence that he is actually going against the grain and going against what he actually wants to do. But even I remember, I remember James Owens took charge of, oh, geez, I can't remember, one of the early games, first or second round. And I was actually going to tweet at the start of the game. I was going to say, geez, delighted to see James Owens refereeing here, get fairly guaranteed an open game. And then it was just stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. I think it was Limerick tipped the first evening, actually, that Saturday yeah. evening. And there again, he's quite high in that because I would say again he had to go against his natural instincts I'd love to know uh, the difference from would say round one and two to maybe I can tell you. round four or five can you? Brilliant yeah because that, that'd, be, that'd be interesting Yeah I can give you the first three rounds anyway so the open round of league saw an average of 29 frees per game then it became 37 frees per game in round uh, two and then round three it became 23 so it all you know, <laughs> not, uh, you know cut unreal, about 40 yeah. percent or something that, like that that's unbelievable yeah and so like three is more like that's more normal like yeah well look and it's not like i'm taking a pop at some of the guys at the top end of this i mean an average of 40 frees per game is is really really high even like i mean you're looking at some of them there 39 and a half frees 35 31 you have to you have to probably um factor in that they, some of these referees on certain weeks were told this is how you need to referee a game and I'm sure some of our eagle eye viewers out there will know off the top of their heads well this guy refereed in week one week two whatever and uh, that kind of bucked the trend that week and so on and if you do please get your comments in we know abs we absolutely love getting those in and by the way there's an interesting one with Johnny Murphy and you know, I was just going to bring up his name. I was just going yeah, to bring up his name, yeah. Because he he's on the list here, and he's down towards the bottom, and it's twenty three and a half frees per game, which is you know I mean that that's very good. I think a game is pretty much flowing. I mean a game isn't flowing if there's forty frees, but like he pulled Cork four times for throwing the ball in one game. Yet in the entire league there was only fourteen throws that were called for. So it's it's mm. kind of interesting. Every kind of ref has their thing that they really hone in on. That Johnny Murphy one is even more interesting because he's 47 frees over two games. He definitely called more than 47 frees in one game between Dublin and Wexford at Crow Park last year. I think De it definitely. Was, was it 42 I think, I think, frees or 50 oh, frees? It was I something think it was, crazy. I think it was 50, yeah, because Davey went absolutely you know, ballistic after. and like, It's just that everything was being blown. So it just shows... Like I would, I'd be, I'd be safely say that Johnny Murphy took charge of league games towards the end of the league. Whereas if it had been at the start, he could have been up near that 40 or 50 again in one game. Yeah, we've got some of our regular commenters coming in already. I had it on screen already, Liam O'Neill. Great weekend of hurling. As a Cork fan, hopefully Cork can win, but Limerick are strong favourites. Patrick Hickey has come in with, uh, the t with the studs up straight away. He's a clear man. The bias hour has started. Looking forward, look forward to this. That's Luke. Patrick Hickey that done me on Twitter there a couple of weeks ago with the Adams Adam Sandler water boy. Um, <laughs> what does it look like? I think he's taken no prisoners lately. Luke Toomey, there won't be more than three points in Cork v Limerick. We're going to preview that. Uh, JP, X, etc. I expect Limerick to give Cork a right lesson. This Limerick team have only got better. Limerick will want to put on a near perfect performance. Well, look, every team is, is out to do that. And let us know what you think as well. We'll obviously be talking about those Leinster and Munster matches. We won't be letting it escape our attention that the Joe McDonough, the Christy Ring, Nicky Rackard, and Laurie Maher are also on this weekend. You were speaking to, to Kieran Carey, the Limerick legend, about uh, the water breaks and you know how he's trying to sort out or how he would like to see tackling sorted out. Yeah, I think I think he kind of talking about how maybe the flow of games has been interrupted. He just he said the water breaks were bad enough, and he just said then, particularly in the early stages of the league, how that that kind of uh, spare hand tackle was was being pulled in the league. Think he just said I'll just read exactly what he says here, talking about that uh, he thinks they're lazy and needless frees and they're damaging the game as a spectacle. Spectacle. He just said it is a grey area. And you can blatantly see it's still happening. Everybody wants to get an advantage, but the pulling of the arm and the pulling of the shoulder, it's a very lazy free. The referees have to blow it if it's happening. A free is a free. 
it's stopping the real flow of the game that you want to see. It's already bad enough with the two water breaks that you're pulling the handbrake and going for a drop of water and not much water has been drank and it's stop and it's so stop and start. I'd love to go back to the full 35 minutes and two teams going hard at it. The water breaks is bad enough, but having two teams as well that are very ill-disciplined around the pulling and dragging of the arms is definitely going to affect the championship unless this particular one is confronted and nailed and no grey area is left. And he just said it, it was the onus was on headquarters to sort it out. Um, the spare hand tackle has been a problem for a while. when uh, I, And it has been coached. And he just said here, there are teams coaching their players to have their hands wide and be strong to stop a player coming through. But in the heat of battle, when that's happening, it's very easy to leave the hand in three or four inches and it ends up up around the neck. And then all of a sudden you do have a yellow and you do have a potential red as well. But that kind of near hand or the spare hand tackle is definitely being coached by a lot of uh, a lot of coaches within the county setups because you were getting away with it up until probably the start of this year's league. Chances are you'll probably still get away with a good bit of it in championship, but it's such a grey area. It's so, something that just really needs to be definitively written down. You can do this, you can't do this. If you do, if you don't, the spare hand tackle, it's going to be pulled or there's going to be some sort of punishment for it. There has to be a deterrent for team to make teams stop doing it and to make coaches stop coaching it. Yeah, because the whole thing is you have to be trying to tackle the ball. Isn't it? Like, isn't that what you're always kind of told? But, yeah. you know, it's gone too far to really just say now we have to get back to to making it a clean as a whistle game. I'm sure it never was. Imagine back in the day when it was 21 aside and they were trying to bait a ball up and down the road into each other's village to see who won a game. <laughs> I'd say there was skin and hair flying then. I, I'm not really sure what you can do to change it. Like, it is up to interpretation. And every player who's out there understands what is and isn't a foul as they do it. And they kind of know that, mm, I could get called for that. I might get away with that. I'm not 100% sure. Like, so even if you as a player, you're kind of pushing the boundaries midway through the game and you're not fully sure if that's a free or not. And sometimes you get away with it and sometimes you don't, which kind of adds to the frustration of everybody out there. I, I'm not really sure what you do. I think there's always going to be gray area. And if you try to... If you try to prescribe exactly what is and isn't a tackle, you'll end up a game with far less physicality because players will just be saying, after you to the man coming out with the ball because I can't make any contact with them. Like, we need contact in the game. So I think it's kind of an impossible task to try and to define the tackle. It is a tricky one. And as you said, I think as a player, you're kind of, you you have a perception of how the referee is refereeing the game after 10 or 15 minutes. And you, I know this might sound bad, but you generally have a perception of what you're going to get away with and what you want. That's just the fact. You're judging what's going on around you. I do think the, the spare hand is one that's, that, that is a bit of a blight on the game, though. Whatever about, you know, other, other tackles, that, that spare hand where you actually, you know, you can't actually lift your hand or your, your two or three steps are nearly taken away from you. I'm not exactly 100% sure how you solve it, but we should probably try and do something to, ma to make it a bit... Like, that's not tackling, Shane, really. Do you know what I mean? Spare hand tackle and lads holding a hand down or something for a second. That's not a tackle. That's not like a shoulder or a hook or any of the, you know, the the normal, the, the traditional ways to tackle. It's something that's kind of crept in in, re in recent years. I don't think it does anything. I don't think, don't know if it does anything positive for the game. I put it no, but if, if we started blowing up every one of them, people would be going nuts. So, like, there's got to be very clear communication from, from the GA saying, look, we're going after this spare hand thing. Not every one of them will be caught. But we're going to make we're going to blow every one of them. So the first few weeks, teams because they're going to persist with doing this, we know they will. They're, the teams themselves are going to make hurling a very bad spectacle for a few weeks while we stamp this out. So on the far side of it, we'll have a much better game. The alternative is to is to maybe just allow an advantage every time that there's a a pull. So like a lot of the time that pull happens because you want to stop a player getting the ball away or you want to stop him putting it up on his stick or whatever. And we've seen situations where there'll be a little half pull, which actually stops you getting the ball away. And then you end up getting done for steps. Because, That's the worst now. That's yeah, the worst. That's a killer. Because to get away, you need another two. You know, you need to adjust and get another step or two involved or into your movement and then eventually try and get the ball away. And I know I talked about it before, but the All-Ireland Final in 2017, I thought Watford got caught a few times with that. And, you know, they were at the wrong end of that. And I felt quite sorry for them. But... um. Yeah, I think there's. I, I, yeah, I'm just, th yeah, I'm just thinking in my, in my head of something you're saying there. Just say a referee sees that happening, C could blow a free, could also put their hand up, and all of a sudden, uh, this might sound a bit bizarre, but all of a sudden the player in possession gets another four steps. 
Which is yeah. sad. That's, that, that's kind of the direction I was I was think, yeah. initially thinking of moving in, that he just put the hand up and say, on you go, and then the players look at him and, and he just go like that. Do you know, like, yeah. or, or make that symbol, whatever. I'm sure that looked a little bit odd, but, <laughs> you know, the point is there all the same. <laughs> Patrick Hickey says, ha-ha, on the banner. And Mike's in it some weekend coming up. All traditional counties to win. Galway, Wexford, Tip and Cork to win. Kieran Fenley, with a surname like Fenley, I think we can guess where he's from. Kilkenny not a traditional county anymore. Well, that was the first thing that struck me when he said traditional counties and he had Wexford in instead of Kilkenny. Yeah, um, and certainly, do you know what? I wonder is it time for Cork to get back uh, on top? Is it? No, we'll come to that in a minute. Button it up there for one second. We have to talk about James Duggan's point on his knee for leash over the week or during the week against Westmead. So he'd, uh, he'd struck one and then he started hobbling. And maybe he was playing a bit of rope a dope with the goalkeeper because uh, all of a sudden he was able to move, caught one Superman style, and threw her over the lat. It was lovely stuff. Uh, I tell you what, I had a couple of. Uh, you, you know the way you put something into a WhatsApp group, and you usually have the first, a few miserable people that won't acknowledge a <laughs> score and will say, Sure, how did he miss the first chance? <laughs> you know, you always have a few people like that. So I put into a group, and I, I, I just, I don't know what I said back to your man when he gave me that bit of negativity. But the catch, the, the, the catch was outrageous. Like, it, the, the, it actually wasn't a bad puck out. But he just found this burst off the ground. I don't know. And he said his two calves seized up and he knew he wasn't going to be able to stand up. So he just basically fell to his knees and like it was, a, it was an outrageous score. And like, I love the, the commentary. I love the commentary. It was like, he didn't just do that. You know, it was brilliant. It was like the King and JR. Like. Well, do you know what? <clears throat> uh, pardon me. This isn't the first time James Duggan has done something like this. Have a little look at this. People might remember this from a while back. Do you know, I mean, you can't coach that sort of class, can yeah. you? I think we talked about that before, and I would basically be giving all those defenders the, cur the curly the curly fingers straight away before <laughs> anything else. But yeah, no, I, I, it was absolutely brilliant. And anybody that was uh, that was in Omar Park the other night, one of the great underage games, by all accounts. Absolutely Ridiculous score of a game. Yeah. yeah, was there any defending going on at all? But that's the way Hurling <laughs> has gone now. Sure, the pulling and dragging is gone. Huh? You're not allowed to anymore. It's a forwards game. Yeah, I do agree with you. It is It is becoming a forwards game. And also, because of that, teams are picking more, I would say, lads who probably grew up as wing forwards are now playing as wing backs, and there's probably fewer true defenders. Or maybe players are being coached in different ways now. The players that you're bringing through, you don't want to bring them through in the old traditional way, and you're, you're looking to bring lads who can hurt. I mean, Davy Fitz has probably talked about this before. You interviewed Joe O'Connor. He would have been a wing forward growing up, and then he's been more of a corner back carrying the ball out very comfortable. So that's the way it's kind of that's the way it's kind of gone now. Um, the Leinster semi-finals this weekend, we'll jump into those. There's going to be 8,000 people at Croke Park on Saturday. I'm going to be there. I'm not sure if you're going to be there. Niall Corcoran is a guy you picked out that he's kind of got a foot in three out of the four camps here. A, a finger in, a, in quite a few of the pies, Galway, Dublin and Kilkenny, Wexford. He's obviously part of the, the Wexford management team. Played for Dublin. And obviously, uh, minor with Galway as well, being an air court man. So, uh, yeah, he'll know. He, he'll be very interested all of a sudden. He won't know which way to look. I just thought it was an interesting one because you do have this. Uh, you have it at club level at times as well. And you definitely have it at county level where guys have been involved in several different camps. He's obviously originally from Galway, as you said, uh, moved and done, nearly, done all his county hurling with Galway. Um, he like if Leash were playing, if Leash were playing uh, Wexford this weekend, he'd actually have a hand in all four camps. He would have been involved in all four camps at different stages. Just interested to find from our viewers, um, do they know many people who have like what's the max? They say John Motton has been involved with five county teams. Um, you know, in four Mickey different Moran, provinces. How many has Mickey Moran been involved? Yeah, in? a, a fair few. I think Mohan was the first hurling manager anyway to uh, do the Grand Slam, to be involved in a, uh, managing a county in four different provinces. And I just wonder, are, are there many more people, many more lads out there that people know of? Like, what's the max, you know, different counties, people involved in between playing, coaching and managing? It'd be interesting to find out. Mickey Moran would, de would definitely be, be high up there, I'd say. But it'd just be interesting to hear wh what people have to say on it. Yeah, yeah, get the, those comments in. Uh, Matty Kenny and uh, Shane O'Neill have met before at Croke Park. Well, obviously, they're over um, Dublin and Galway this weekend. There's a small bit of history here, of course. 
Like, yeah. I mean, the, the, the last time they met was, or sorry, in Championship was the Club All Ireland replay. That was in O'Moore Park, but they, they had a drawn clash at Croke Park here three and a bit years ago. It's funny how, uh, it's funny how, like, this does happen. Like, the high profile man club managers and guys, you know, of a particular vintage who are only, you know, in their 40s or whatever, they do, well, yeah, it's kind of natural enough that they'll end up at county level. But it's funny that they on like, a little over three years ago that they played, in a, you know, an All Ireland series. Uh, final and replay, obviously, in two epic games that you were obviously involved in too. Um, like, was there anything like? Would you have sensed that that Shane O'Neill would make the step to inter-county management as quick, uh, as quick as he did? Because it's very, very quick. Matty Kenny, it was probably fairly signposted. Well, Matty had been involved with the Galway under twenty ones and the Galway seniors, so he'd kind of been around the block to some degree. And going into that, you know, we'd already won one club all Ireland, so he'd kind of like the CV was already fairly good at that point. So then it was a case of adding to it from Shane O'Neill's point of view, you know, he's obviously an inter-county player uh, in, in previous years. Um, but I have to say, I've been really impressed with how they had operated throughout the season and the way that they, I certainly felt that they tactically won the battle that first day at Croke Park and he got his matchups very, very right. And obviously it went down to extra time. They were in a great position, three points up going into injury time and Shane Dowling had a free to make it four points and that didn't go over. And then Sean Moran got the free and all that uh, put in the back of the net. But, you know, I was very, very impressed tactically with with how he set his team up. So I, I think that won't be, I think that'll be in the back of their minds here that they've got previous before. And I think this game could be very, very good. Like, I, I'm certainly looking forward to this one. Um, Galway against Dublin also means it's a chance for Joe Canning if he can knock over quite a few points in this game to become the record point scorer of all time, which which is quite a feat. Uh, it'd be unbelievable. If he hits 13, he ties with Henry. And if he hits 14, he overtakes him. And interesting, he's done it in, and you're bringing it up there now, he's done it in less games than Henry as well. So he's a, he's a mass, what's it, 27, 4, 7, 1. That's 5, 5, 2 altogether in 60 games. Whereas Henry amassed uh, 27, 4, 8, 4. That's 5, 6, 5 in 71 games. So okay. like, the stats on the Wikipedia are slightly different, but sure, we get the gist anyway. He's thirteen yeah. points shy, is what you're saying. Thirteen points shy in eleven in, in eleven less games, which is which is fair going. Now that's probably like a lot to do with the fact that there's more scores in hurling now, probably as well. Games are more high scoring as well, but uh, it'd be a fair it'd be a fair achievement to over like. You know, when records are set, it doesn't look like they'll be overtaken for a while. Like, Henry's only finished in 14, and all of a sudden his, his championship scoring record could be overtaken just just seven years later. You're, when, you're, when you create one of these records, like kind of like maybe Tony McCoy in the horse racing, with, I think it was 20 straight champion jump jockeys titles, you, you nearly have to, like, break new ground three or four times during the record just to, just to keep everybody away from you for a long, long time. Mm. I'm, I'm even just looking at this and you know people can see it there I'm, I'm highlighting it Nicky Rackard with uh, 59 championship goals it's savage, isn't it? yeah. yeah he scored seven in one all Ireland semi-final against Antrim if I have my stats right but isn't it interesting that there aren't too many like there aren't too many cor like monster teams actually in the top end of it so Henry Shefflin number one a uh, Galway man number two uh, TJ Reid for Eddie Kerr five uh, Christy Ring is down there at eight. Owen Kelly and, and Seamus Callanan and Patrick Horgan, as far as Munster, they're up there, all right. And it is mostly going to be modern players because of the amount of games. Now, there's far more games being played by the average inter county player than there used to be in the past. But I would say if you've gone through Leinster in modern times, you've had far more turkey shoots. So players like Henry Shefflin and Joe Canning, obviously, the last uh, 12 years they've been in Leinster. You know, it, it is a fact of life that you're not going to hammer that many teams in Munster. You're going to hammer, like if you're a top team, you're going to hammer plenty of teams in in Leinster over the last decade or so. You know, you've been in the doldrums. Leash have had some heavy beatings. You know, the likes of Carlo, Antrim, you know, different teams that have been in their West Mead. They have had big score lines put up in them. So I think if you're a Munster person looking at that, you have to say, well, can we include the fact that Munster is much more difficult to put up those score lines in individually? Yeah, you have to have that caveat there as well. And if there is... Uh, David Tuberty would have said he obviously is the, the highest uh, scorer in the history of the National Football League. He would have said that some of that came obviously against Division 4 teams and Division 3 teams. He would have said that kind of openly himself. But the last couple of years when he's done a lot of scoring, it's been all Division 2 against really, really good teams. Niall Gilligan is the one that surprised me there. 
I wouldn't have I wouldn't have remembered obviously he was a brilliant forward but I wouldn't have am- remembered him amassing those sort of totals that would have left him in there and particularly as you say like they were playing you know Waterford tip Limerick Cork like nearly every day as well so he's definitely one that Don that surprised me even though his longevity I suppose at county level was quite long not quite as long as the club level but still quite long in fairness yeah and Shane Dooley there at number 10 considering as I'd said Offaly had suffered quite a number of beatings over the years. That's great going. Um, a couple of other guys standing out there. Paul Flynn of Watford, of course, absolutely brilliant player. Shane Dowling, despite having his uh, career curtailed far too young, he's obviously uh, d- doing really well to be at number 18 there. And if, if he didn't have the amount of in- knee injuries in the past couple of years, maybe he'd be slightly higher. And considering so, he didn't start in, in 18 or 19, Shane, that's fair going too, like... Yeah, it absolutely you is. Uh, we have a couple of comments in here. One from John S. Lads, Nicky Rackard's 59 goals would have been in an era when a fullback and keeper were allowed to beat a full forward like they were beating a bullock. Incredible <laughs> achievement. <laughs> oh, they'd be killed, like, in fairness. And it was an era, and in an era as well when goalies would be killed too. Like, mm. it was, they were fair game. When the ball went in around a goalie, like, I wonder what, you know, what some of the great goalies uh, back in the day would think looking in now, like, when the keeper is touched... And he goes down and gets a free. Like referees are only looking to give him a free. Like you know, you know the famous iconic image of the the Waterford keeper uh, soaring above uh, Christy Ring for that that unbelievable catch. One of the most iconic pictures in GA history. Like he would have been killed, and that's why he was gone up <laughs> protecting himself uh, because keepers were killed back in the day. I suppose no oh. more than the full forwards were. Ash, the old paddy cap, the old tweed cap, that yeah, keep the head yeah. okay back then. <laughs> oh, you have to love some of the old pictures of the first helmets that came on board, you know, basically motorcycle type helmets. And even if you go back to the, the 80s and 90s, and some of the helmets and the face guards were absolutely cat. By the way, Liam O'Neill is after adding in here. Ben O'Connor, what a savage player. But you, yeah. uh, just even to talk a little bit more about Joe Canning, and he said that it's um, it's not all about what's beside your name in terms of scores. He goes, I never really looked at the numbers beside my names. I think that's the wrong way to think about things. What you score, that's not really what matters. It's how you contribute to the overall winning and losing of the game that really matters. Some days you could score nothing, but you contributed five scores for other players. Does that mean if you had a, uh, you had a bad game? No, because you contributed to the game. For me, if I scored five points and all I had to do was get a great last minute pass and just pop it over. Sometimes you find that skews a view. Uh, perception can be funny and, and and on it goes. And I mean, he, I mean, if you go back to 2015, his cross field ball up the field to Shane Maloney, which allowed Galway to beat Tipperary. I mean, that was as crucial as any score that he's actually got himself. I know they didn't win the All Ireland, but you know, just in that moment, that game, it felt like the biggest thing in the world that day. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I think we're probably all guilty of it. Uh, a game that we haven't seen and going to the match report and seeing, you know, what did he score or whatever. That's why I think, you know, ratings maybe beside uh, beside everybody's name does help an awful lot. Just say like it's Jay Canning, uh, eleven points, six frees, and you look at the ratings and he's only got maybe a seven out of ten, and you're thinking, oh, maybe there was a there were a couple of handy points that he was thrown out, and then maybe you're looking at a. You know, Jay Canning, 10 points, 10 frees, and he has a nine. And you're thinking, mm. geez, he must have set up some amount to play. But if you don't have the rate and you don't really know, and you're just basing it on, on what you see, uh, it's interesting as well. Uh, and it's something I've talked regularly to boys about, particularly lads that have played. Like Canning now is at that age where I genuinely would say he doesn't care that much about how he plays in games as long as he contributes something and Galway win the game. But I know I definitely would have been, and I think anyone that's honest with themselves, years ago, when you were younger, you definitely would have been more selfish, I would say. Um, and you would have, like, this is a bit strange to say, maybe, but, like, would you have preferred to play well, personally, and lose a game? Or would you prefer to play okay or bad and win a game? Well, it's it's the most horrible question going, and everyone kind of understands this one. And I have a friend of mine, and look, we all know those those players. I'd say I'm sure it's the same, whether it's male or female GA and any sport around the world. You're like, well, you know what? I did my bit, and I can walk away with my hand a head held high. And you know what? The other one is, you know, sometimes when you're injured for a, cl- a club match, we'll say, are you? Oh, here we match? go. I've yeah. been in this position. I know this one. I know yeah. what's coming here. The, t- the, the team gets hammered. You were injured and everyone starts looking at it. Jez, they badly missed him today. Your stock rises even though you didn't fuck him up. <laughs> so uh, that, that, that's an awful cruel one. But like, I don't think anyone can say it uh, openly that, yeah, look, 
I'm really just about myself. But there are times where you like if you're sitting on the bench for a long time, you nearly like and you're pushing so hard, you're nearly so desperate to get on. You, you'd rather get on than, uh, you know, that's the be all and end all. The main thing is let me get out there. Let me give, give it a shot. And you know, be what may after that. But like, it's very hard to give a sort of definitive answer on this. Actually, I did a piece a couple of years ago about uh, the scoring, and here's the some of the stats that I had on Joe Canning. And you can see here, um, I only just thought of bringing it up now, but like, he used to score so freely from play. This is with it at inter county level. Um, obviously, he's a Portumna man, but these are the sort of scores overall. And then from play, now this is up to 2020, so you can add a few scores on for the championship this year. But you can see that. He was scoring 214 from play, 219, 29 from play, 38, 213, 212. Like a good percentage of his scores were always coming from play. And in 2014, I think that was the year that maybe Connor Cooney took over the freeze, that uh, nine points of his 211 came from that. And then next year, like 2015, like what a brilliant year, scored 415 from play in the championship games. But then you see, coinciding with probably the move up to centre forward. The scores started to dry up. Now, I remember he scored that goal against Clare in Turles, I believe. That was an All Ireland quarter final. Remember the one just after half time? Yeah. They won the throw in. Davy Burke set off on a solo, hit it over to Canning. Did he touch and straight and struck it lovely straight into the low, into the net? That was brilliant. But that is his most recent championship goal from play. So in 2016, 1 6 from play, 17, 10 points when they won the All Ireland, 22 points in 18, uh, 19. Uh, two points. That was obviously when he came on against Dublin um, after being out for the season. And then 2020, I don't think that's the entire season stats. I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I just kind of checked there at the top of the head. I, I didn't really have a, a plan to bring that up. But you can just see that his importance has been so key in the last few years in particular. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't necessarily need to be all scores from play for you to become um, a massive part of the team. So I think no, it definitely of, doesn't. And he's gone yeah. way further out the field. And it used to be David Burke was the provider for him. And now Canning is often the provider for others. And he's the one picking out a pass. And um, he'll obviously strike from distance when he gets a chance. But he's, he's very good at picking out a ball as well. And I do think Galway fans are kind of clamouring for him to return to the edge of the square at the, at various stages, particularly after it kind of happened organically in that Waterford game, picked up a knock and ended up in around the full forward line and was really, really dangerous. So like that's something interesting. Will we see that at different stages this weekend? I do ex expect us to see it at different stages throughout the championship for him to be gone in there, even for 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah, a few more comments coming in here. Eamon Coleman, Milan has to be one of the best from play, average over three points per game. Uh, I think that sort of his stats were boosted somewhat from the time he marked you, and and obviously went. To <laughs> he only got he actually only got a point that day, but he that that's a classic case of he did uh, so much more than what was on the scoreboard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kieran Stubbins, Shane Dowling in the top 20 with injuries and her career cut very short and for a team that have uh, to get get murdered to win a free is some achievement do Limerick have to get murdered to win a free? Yeah I don't know about that now there might be a small bit of bias there it, you might, uh, one of our viewers is talking about the bias hour but there's plenty of bias from a lot of our viewers towards their counties as well Yeah there's any and all amounts of it uh, Popo, Paul Flynn was one of the best stickmen of all time an artist with a slitter, never needed pace let his skill do the talk. And yeah, Here's one for you. Would Paul, I have a, a closed peg in my hand, sorry to interrupt. Ideal. Point. <laughs> but would Paul Flynn, this is just off the top of my head, would Paul Flynn make most inter-county teams now with the, just say, if he was still that type of player with the maybe the lack of pace and just focusing on skill, would would a team carry a player like that if even if he wasn't able to do the tackling, do the covering ground that other guys were able to do? Well, my answer is, and, and like Paul Flynn was, when he had the ball in his hand, he was still elusive. So yeah, uh, I, I think it's crucial to make that distinction. He may not have been kind of running laps during the middle of a game, but when he could get away from his man and find that yard of space. John Bubbles O'Dwyer. You know, I mean, la the All-Ireland final a few years ago, crucial. All-Ireland 2016, crucial 2014. He averages something like five points uh, from play per game in All-Ireland finals. So yeah. I mean, no, I don't I, think I, I, think I don't think, yeah, I don't think Bubbles is slow, and I'm only I was only posing the question about Flynn. Mm. I think, but any, he's not doing laps like he's not. Yeah, doing. yeah, but I think any manager like with a player like that, you can all there's always a way to work him in. Like he's just too classy. Like there's always a way to work to work him in. 
Yeah, and uh, Popo agrees with the the point there on Bubbles and Flynn, and maybe maybe neither of those players would agree. But get your get your comments in and let us know if you think there's any other players of that ilk. Uh, Seamus Stapleton, no relation, I don't think. Munster teams are just as likely to play a weak Leinster team in the qualifiers, though. So that's uh, referring back to the point about how that uh, top score thing is dominated somewhat by um, by players from the the Leinster Championship. But I think more frequently they would be playing each other. Yeah, I, I, I understand the point too. But like if you're Kilkenny some years probably went through and played against a couple of the teams that been they've been routinely beaten for years. So I, I had, a lot of the time they would have been directly into a, a semi-final, but they were winning Leinster games by so much. You were hockey in a team in a Leinster semi-final and a final. That's not to detract away from the record there. Obviously, you know, they're doing brilliantly, uh, those players over the years. And like for a while, Galway were just directly into an All-Ireland sort of quarterfinal slash qualifier and they were playing Antrim. And I think Joe Canning's debut, didn't they put up like 520 on them or something like that? And that's not something that in those days you're routinely seeing in Munster Club Championship or Munster Championship matches. No, there, you can definitely find, find outliers of when there was massive score lines. But I think as a general point, that's what I'd say to that. So we'll, we'll come back to Galway against Dublin this weekend. It kind of feels like, given Galway's form during the league, that they only have to show up to win this game. Now, it's never going to be as simple as that, but it, I think it's a case of show up, get a job done, because they probably do have the firepower to win this game, and maybe that's where Dublin are going to struggle, even though they put up 3.31 against Antrim. I think as, as neutrals, we're all an awful lot happier a week later. Like, if you, you know, before last Saturday, we would have said, listen, Galway are going to walk their way through to a Leinster final. And I would have definitely been favouring Kilkenny on the other side. And then all of a sudden, Wexford put up a massive performance and full of confidence. And Dublin put up a huge performance against Antrim. But there was a bit of pressure on and people were talking about this is the biggest game in Dublin hurling in, in a long while. So... Uh, Dublin are coming. Dublin's graph is after going up a small bit, and at least they're coming in with a bit of confidence. Like there's very, you go through their team the last day, there was very few guys that didn't hurl well. So there's loads of confidence coming into this game. Um, as I said, they have they did trouble, like not trouble them. They beat Galway just two years ago, and I just kind of think it's funny that should have been nearly the game to you know ignite Matty Kenny's reign, and they go on a run and maybe get to an All Ireland semi final. Obviously, we know how that worked out when they were beaten by Leash two weeks later. But this could be the game to reignite his reign. Um, like all of a sudden, if they be if they were to beat Galway and get to a Leinster final, that opens up, you know, an All Ireland quarter final and possibly an All Ireland semi final if they were to win Leinster. So this is a huge game, and I think, uh, I I think they they learned a good bit last weekend as well and got a good bit of it, even the likes that we're just talking about. Um, young players emerging during the championship. The likes of Keno Sullivan, who now I think he'll get a different prospect this weekend coming up against Galway. But the like the likes of him and guys came in for, for Dublin and staked a bit of a claim and as we talked about in Monday's show, their their key men were were dominant. Mm. Sutcliffe was dominant, O'Don- O'Donnell was dominant. Uh, maybe you wouldn't say Crummy was dominant, but he was still very, very effective. B- big Ronan Hayes, really, really dominant at the edge of the square as well. So I think it changes the, the dynamic of the game, just the, the nature of the victory and how Dublin are coming into this game. I do still fancy Galway to win it, but I think Dublin will ask them maybe more questions than... Uh, they definitely, in my head, I think they're going to ask them more questions than, than I thought they would a week ago anyway. Is it fair to say that, you know, the, the commentary that surrounded Dublin for so many years about manufactured herders and, and some of this talk, which was a little bit insulting to, to the quality of the players and... You know, they didn't. Some of those players did win Leinster, a Leinster title, got to an All Ireland semi final, arguably should have beaten Tipperary in 2011 in that semi, and then Cork in 2013. Like, I definitely found that hard to stomach the talk of the manufacturer, but there are, there was, there was certainly some limited players in there as well that gave oxygen to that conversation. But some of the players that have come through in the last couple of years are, are starting to really stake a claim now, maybe under the radar because maybe not everyone pays that much attention to Dublin. But are are they more pure hurlers? Like I, I think Connor Burke, he looks like a really good hurler. So comfortable on the ball, so comfortable coming out with possession. He can strike it. Yeah, the Cork game didn't probably go his way in the qualifiers last year, but he looks really, really comfortable. It was very good against Antrim last year, last week, I should say. Keen Boland. I think he would have established himself a little bit more by now if he didn't have so many injuries. But like I think he's a hurler. I think Ronan Hayes, who you and I have talked about a lot. He's a hurler. Like Sean Moore, who I've obviously played with for years, 
he's a real hurler and he wasn't always involved with the Dublin team. He's late twenties now, obviously, but he was away for a while a couple of different times. But he's a he's a hurt like there are real hurlers in this team now. No, I'd agree with you. Yeah, there's definitely a lot more kind of uh, people. Yeah, people would have thrown that the uh, manufactured hurler argument out there. There's definitely got a lot of guys that look like naturals anyway at the moment. Mm. Like to me, Ronan Hayes is a natural finisher. He's re- really, really natural. He'd, he's everything you'd want in in a full forward. Uh, I think over the next you know, over the next three or four years, he could become one of the one of the best forwards in the country if he if he stays injury free. The big thing I like in my in my head, I just can't get away from what the Galway forward line is going to be and how Dublin are going to try and match up with them. Like, if you go through, you know, potentially what the Galway forward line uh, will be, we'll just say if, if Joe Canning is playing in the forward line, it could be something like, uh, it could be something like Joseph Cooney, uh, Joe Canning could be wing or centre forward, Evan Island could be the other, either wing or centre forward, Connor Whelan it maybe inside, uh, Brian Kincannon, uh, Connor Cooney, uh, Adrian Tui comes into the mix then as well, having played there in the league. Sean Loftus comes into the mix as well. Niall Burke comes into the mix too. And I'm just going through, when you go through the raw materials of that goal of forward line, I, I, outside of probably O'Donnell maybe picking up uh, Connor Whelan, I'm not sure where they're going to go with a lot of the other guys. A lot of the matchups are going to be really, really interesting. Oh, they're they, they, very, very tasty matchups. Like, I think Connor Whelan, we could see a return, a reprisal of Connor Whelan against Don O'Donnell. As we saw in 2019, and funnily enough, they both went off injured early in the game. Um, just actually, while, while I think of it now, there has been some change in that Dublin. I'll come back to the matchup. Some change in that Dublin team in the past couple of years. Like, guys that we won't see involved from that game. Now, Dublin had a couple of injuries at the that day, and I remember Keno Callahan, who will start, he was one of them. But Shane Barrett's not involved in the panel anymore. Darrell O'Connell isn't. Sean Tracy isn't. Tomas Connolly is, but I haven't I haven't seen him play just yet, so I don't know if he's fallen down the pecking order or if he's injured. Conal Keeney's retired. Trollier, oh, Eamon Dillon, he's out for the season. Oshin O'Rourke has seen minimal game time. He has come on, and, and he might be in the reckoning this week. Liam Rush was... Bear was walking around the field that day because of an ankle injury. He was full forward then. He may be centre back now. So the team has changed over a nice bit. And actually, some of the subs that day have kind of established themselves. James Madden, he's uh, he's in around the middle of the field a lot now. Fergal Whiteley came on the last day. Dara Gray has firmly established himself as a wing back. And Ronan Hayes came on that day. And he's, I think he's kind of number one now. He is the target man in that team. But like you said with the with the matchups, just going through those forwards. Brian Concannon possibly um possibly marked by Paddy Smith. Maybe Keen O'Callaghan would go up against my, I don't know, my, it's, my, it's wor- my worry my worry my worry for Dublin will be uh while Smith and O'Callaghan are two good defenders, pay, pace wise like Concannon is lightning. He is lightning. Um, so I, I think he's... I, I think don't know if pace huge. is an issue for Dublin there. I think maybe the trickery of those forwards is what... Because those those forwards are doing damage against most teams. I think it's more their trickery and the quality of ball they'll get than this. Like, think about it. Keno Callahan and Paddy Smith and Owen O'Donnell have had some unbelievable games in the last few years. And oh, no, they have, yeah. We, we talked about that backline. They obviously ripped up the backline a little bit in terms of putting uh, Chris Crummy up the field and Liam Rush has been in and out and Sean Moore has been in and out of the team. But that full backline, those players, like we've kind of talked about them a lot, has been up at the best in the country. No, we have, in fairness, yeah. We have. Um, interestingly, uh, from, uh, from Shane O'Neill's point of view, if uh, O'Donnell is going to pick up Whelan, I think they'll try and pull O'Donnell away from the square. Yeah. I don't think Whelan plays full forward if O'Donnell picks him up. That's interesting then. So if O'Donnell is picking up Whelan, or maybe only if he's in the full forward line, which is a trick, which is a, which is a tricky one. Then we didn't throw Cottle Mannion into the mix there as well, who potentially could could, could sit <laughs> out. Could be could, of the year, could, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and could sit out uh, as a deep line centre forward and really cause Liam Rush damage if that's the role. Like I think they'll really try and. Uh, I think they'll try and go after Rush in the sense that Rush wants to sit back and yeah. Galway have two or three players that could, you know, really do serious damage. Dean McManus did big damage the other day. I know he wasn't maybe always on Rush, but he played out that he deep line. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, he, he scored yeah. six, you know. He played out deep. So like you can't you can't leave Cottle Manning, you can't leave Nyland, you can't leave Canning, you can't leave Whelan in those in those positions because they will destroy you as well. Just think there's an awful lot of when you go through it. An awful lot is going to have to go right for Dublin, I think, with those with those matchups, uh, in order for them to be 
uh, in order for them to be there neck and neck with Galway right at the finish. Do you think it's kind of changed in terms of like, okay, Verney, you stay at three, Shane, you stay at six, and obviously, like, we're going to go with certain matchups, but you two always stay at three and six. With the way teams fluidly move around now and the way there might be just two in the full back line and three in the half forward line, another guy more or less gone roaming out midfield, like, can you afford to do that anymore? Because let's say you decide, right, I'm going to follow my man, and then if there's a break in play, I'm going to move back to, to centre back or to full back. Like, that's all fine and well, but the opposition might see that and be like, okay, let's keep switching around. And every time there's a break in play, he has to sprint 30 yards to get it back into position. So if Owen O'Donnell is against Conor Whelan, who has moved out to the half forward lines at different times during this year and even last year also, I, I don't know, he might just have to maintain the, the matchup. So I don't know. that. I think in a way, if you're a man and you are, if you're a back and you know... If you're a man. Like, <laughs> if you're a man, man, you might just... It, it might even make your job more simple if you're told just mark him anywhere. I doubt Owen O'Donnell, who, play, who plays centre forward for Whitehall, Hall, Colin Kills, or did, did last year. Anyway, I don't think he'd be unduly bothered if he had to go into the half half back line and mark. Oh, um, not at kind all. Of no. He's done it to TJ Reid before. Remember a couple of years ago, he did yeah. very well. Then. Wouldn't be bothered at all, Shane. But the team could be affected by it. That that that's well, my thing. I well, just where, think... where, where's where where did there to be exploited? I think Liam Rush will stay number six no matter what. I don't think they want him in cornerback necessarily. But I think Paddy Smith can play anywhere along the full back line, and maybe his hurling isn't as good as some of the half back line. But I don't think he's all that bothered. He actually played one of the league games out wing back this year. Obviously, Matty rates him enough to put him out there. Like, does Dara Gray care if he's in the full back line? I don't think he'd care that much. Keno Callahan's played in the half back line. I, I don't. I think they're flexible enough so that they could just maintain the matchups and then tell Liam Rush to hold six. Potentially, I just think. Uh, I just. I just think they're going to be dragged everywhere. And like Dara Gray might be comfortable in the full back line. Uh, if if it was a case where he was left in the full back line on Brian Cannon, I'm not sure how comfortable he'd be. But saying that, I don't know how comfortable a lot of the defenders will be. Um, I just think that's going to be really interesting, and it's one of those things where I I won't be I won't be at that game on Saturday, but I'll definitely be getting on to you. I I'd, I'd love to see I'd love to see a picture from overhead of just exactly how it shapes up and exactly who is on who, and I think that's what you need from your from your color commentator, isn't it? You need to know all that these things that are going on, who's tracking who, because you don't see a lot of it on the telly. But uh, yeah. it's going to be really interesting, and I, I do think though a lot of things are going to have to go right for Dublin. And the more than Whelan going off that day in 19, and I know you say O'Donnell went off as well, but they might need something like that to happen again for maybe for Galway to pick up a knock to one of their bigger men as well. But yeah. it's going to be really, really interesting. And one of the big things that day in 2019 was how Dublin used the puck outs. Uh, Alan Nolan, who, who was in goals last week, he was also in the goal that day. And what he did was a lot of lofted puck outs. Now, this is in Parnell Park, which is a big difference to Croke Park, which I think actually will stand to Galway here, but he did a lot of those lofted pockets that hung and hung and hung, and both Keeney and um, Danny Sutcliffe, who was absolutely brilliant last week against Antrim, they got a lot of joy there. So is that going to cause a little bit of bother for, for Galway? Will they go for a similar tactic, or, you know, is forearm forewarned? Yeah, I'd say... I'd say the latter, Shane. I'd say they'd be they'd be ready they'd be ready for what's coming, and I don't think Danny Sutcliffe will be falling back into the Dublin half back line and allowed to pick up ball like he was the last day. I just don't see that. Um, will they get joy see... against the likes of like Finton Burke's very very good in the air, but and maybe he'll be told you're marking Sutcliffe, but Sutcliffe has has a very uh, a very good way of actually just um, he he's right handed, so you'd think would catch with the left, but a lot of the time he swaps the hurley over then holds his man back and catches as if he's a left-hander with his right hand. So for somebody like Finton Burke, who I presume hasn't marked him that often, if at all, that would be a, a strange one to come up against because players definitely seem to struggle against him when he does that. And he's obviously very, very good in the air anyway. It's very, very smart, isn't it? And very, very quick thinking like to know that you're going to buy yourself, you know, buy yourself two or three feet by doing that if you're able to, if you're able to do it quickly um we talk about the Galway forward line just it's really interesting who's going to play full back and who's going to play center back um it's re really really interesting um they obviously know but i i don't think anybody else definitively would yeah. know at the moment i mean Gerard McInerney was taken off against cork in the last game of the league i don't think he disgraced himself per se but you know maybe he's not absolutely flying it in full back but there, there's a reason that they moved Dahi Burke out to centre back, and that's probably because they wanted the team driven forward there. And you know, we talked about that dream half back line of 
of Porik Mannion, Dahi Burke and Finton Burke. I mean, that's as good as, I mean, that's right there beside Limerick in terms of quality of half back line. But they clearly haven't seen enough from Grode McInerney in the full back line. So do they do, just swap the positions back or does Grode McInerney end up being the odd man out? Uh, I think potentially if he's not playing full back that he mightn't be playing at all. But, yeah. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't know yet. It'd be an interesting one. Like, uh, I think Aiden Hart picked up a concussion against Waterford, so he's he's back all right. But he would be uh, like, are you going to put him in corner back with McInerney full back and and potentially I don't know who the I'm not sure who the other corner be. I don't know if Sean Loftus is going to lose out now. It could be Darren Morrissey, but I, I think like he, for security he'd play Dotty Burke at at full back. And potentially you could see Park Mannion at centre back, and you could even see Aiden Hart at wing back with Finton Burke the other side, and you can m- might even see Johnny Cohen dropping back. You you wouldn't you wouldn't know, but I I think he'll go with. He'd love to have Burke at three and six, but I just don't know. I don't know if he can afford to play him at six. By playing him at six, you're going to cut off a lot of ball. It's going to go into the full back line naturally, and he's going to give you an awful lot going forward. I just, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure. I think you could be taking a bit too much away from the square, especially with if there's going to be a bit of an experience around him and uh, a still an inexperienced enough keeper behind. Yeah, that that's very, very true. Because uh, it's you know it, it hasn't always happened um, for for Ian and Murphy, and he probably needs to take have another big performance or two to really kind of fill those shoes and feel like he's going to stay there forevermore and like Joseph Cooney was played in the back line last year and when they played against Kilkenny in the Leinster semi-final he was a de facto fullback marking Joe Can- or sorry TJ Reid it went quite well that day up until the goal towards the end and I think everyone is just going to talk about how Galway left that game behind them but they played a sweeper last year are Dublin going to offer them a sweeper in this game and we've just dropped his line because, as I said, his mammy has probably rang him once more. But a point I'd like to make, and if viewers want to get a comment in while we're waiting for uh, Michael to just come back online. Last year, um, or sorry, in, in previous times, you might have thought that Dublin would allow Galway to have a sweeper. And with Galway this year, presumably not going to go with one a seventh defender from the start. I wonder, will they be offered one? But the, the thing that I saw with Dublin set up last week when they scored 331 against Antrim was that they played... Um, they played with three inside, so Keane Boland, Keane O'Sullivan, and Ronan Hayes. So the, the matchup between if Dahi Burke plays full back, Ronan Hayes and um, and and Dahi Burke would be a very interesting one. I'm just talking about whether we think that Dublin will offer uh, Michael Verney um, a sweeper to Galway here. If you looked at the game last week, Keane Boland, um, Keane Boland, Keane O'Sullivan, and Ronan Hayes all played in a three-man full forward line. Obviously, there was a different shapes and at different times and some lads came out a little bit farther but I wouldn't be entirely convinced that they will I'd say if Conor Burke has started midfield he'll be dropping back in I think Danny Sutcliffe and Chris Crummy and Donald Burke who was just glorious again I mean another guy I should have mentioned him earlier a pure natural hurler that Dublin now have I think Dublin will leave those three lads up and then the half forward line will be foraging with with Donald Burke having a license to roam and look for space isn't it great to see? Uh, when was the last time you saw three lads standing in full forward line together? Uh, not the whole time, but at some at some stages, it was uh, it was nearly a novel departure. Now at this stage, it's amazing how much hurling has changed. Um, I I'm not sure about the sweeper thing. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, would they be? Are they robbing Peter to pay Paul a bit? Are they gonna Are they gonna struggle to get like really good ball into their own forward line as a result of that? Um. Fair enough, it, it could plug some holes at the back and maybe make sure that Galway don't cut them open as they have cut several teams open during the league. Uh, I, I don't know, you might have um, you might have more of an insight into what's going on inside Matty Kenny's head maybe the week, the, the, week, the week of a championship game. Maybe you're, tr- maybe you're throwing the sweeper talk out there just to kind of put people off. It's hard to know really, to be honest with you. As if I do something like that. But do you think even like with sweepers, are many teams using them anymore? Uh, Everyone is kind of flooding the middle, no doubt about that. And Davy Fitzgerald might have a different name for it, but as far as I'm concerned, Kevin Foley is a sweeper. He's obviously just like a very modern version, one that can carry the ball up and kind of maybe like a libero in soccer, you know, like this ball playing type of sweeper. Like that's what he is, and he's unbelievable at doing it, maybe the best. How many other teams are playing with sweepers? Most of them are just saying we want, like almost reverting to type of the olden days, that we want the centre-back to kind of sit, mark your man when you can, but we want you to sit, which is maybe why we're being a small bit 
uh, unforgiving of of Liam Rush conceding six points to his man last week. But I'd imagine he'd have been told to tighten up on his man after a while. We're winning everywhere else on the field. But are, are teams playing sweepers? So is it kind of like, would you be a little bit left behind as a Dublin team here if you decided we're just going to play a sweeper and that's it? Or they're going to have to roll the dice and, you know, if we get away with it and, sorry, not even get away with it. If we're going well without having a sweeper, we'll persist with that. If we're looking a little bit ropey and there's a lot of space at the back, well, maybe we'll tell Ke- uh, Keen Boland, you join the half forward line and we're going to drop someone back a sweeper, maybe Connor Burke. Well, you mentioned it earlier. I do think the game being switched to Crow Park does change the dynamic of it a bit. Just so much more space. I do think it favours Galway, if, if, if I'm being honest. Um, just because they're going to be so elusive, particularly their attack is going to be so elusive and so hard to tie down. Uh, I, the sweeper is an interesting one. Uh, the, the formations when you don't have the ball, if you're playing a sweeper or dropping a player back, so different than when you do have the ball. Like all of a sudden, uh, if you do have the ball and you're playing with an extra defender, like it gives so many people the license to go forward if you know that maybe there's someone someone sitting back. I, I don't necessarily see it as a defensive tactic anymore, uh, really, because you can... You can use it as an attacking weapon when you have the ball as well. It gives the, even the halfbacks, the cornerbacks at different stages a license to go forward. It gives the, even the midfielders a license to go forward even more. But just playing a de facto sweeper and that's his role and he basically stays there the whole game. In fairness, uh, Kevin Foley doesn't stay there. will go forward when he gets a chance or will offer someone else the opportunity to go forward. I don't know. I, I don't know how much Dublin have worked on that or whether uh, we, just, we saw Conor Burke last year. He's quite adept at playing that role. Um, it's going to be interesting. I, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to know. Like Galway tried to contain last year against Limerick by playing a sweeper, never looked like winning the game. Um, will will Dublin? Will it be the same case with Dublin? Will they keep tight, but like struggle to actually, you know, get ahead or even get level with Galway if they're playing a sweeper while they still might stay in the game? So that's going to be one. Of the, that's going to be one of the most interesting things of the weekend, just to see what way they approach it. And we kind of slaughtered Dublin last year with the way they left themselves wide open to Cork and Thurlis in that qualifier. Like they, they were, they seemed to be pushed too far up the field. Robbie O'Flynn was able to run into acres of space. Jack O'Connor was able to, like there was so much space back there. And size wise, there's probably not too much of a difference between Thurlis and Semple Stadium. Matty Kenny, from being in a dressing room, like he does learn from these things. Maybe this game won't go his way, but. I do think that he will spot that. He'll know that a couple of his players probably don't have the pace of some of the Galway players. I think that that was definitely a problem last year. And maybe it's a problem overall for the team. But I think they look in a better spot than last year. Maybe there was more injuries last year. Whatever it is about them, I'm expecting a a really strong performance here. And Popo kind of says the same. Galway seem to have reverted to type in recent times. Don't know which team will show up. Have a feeling Dublin can turn them over. Could be the year, the underdog. Do you you kind of go along with that, that you don't know which Galway team is going to show up? I actually, I'm fairly certain that they will perform well here. Yeah, no, I'd be confident enough that they're that they're going to turn up. Uh, they, they're generally top of the league. Like they finished yeah. with four wins from from five, losing only to Tipperary and Thurles. They've generally be like take out that fifty minutes against Kilkenny um, after the hour mark in the Leinster final last year, and they've generally been very consistent since twenty seventeen. Really, well, was it not a three point hammering in the All Ireland semi final last year against Limerick? They could have won it, but they were certainly second best. Yeah, they, they, they were second best, but every, everyone's been second best to Limerick, in fairness. And I think Shane O'Neill was, uh, would have learned an awful lot. Like, look at the, the, the team looks, to me, looks completely different this year. Even the, just, uh, even the way they're carrying themselves, I would say, this year. Look, like, and the tactics that they're using are a lot more, um, are a lot more positive, shall we say. He was, like, he, you look at last year, he'd a new keeper. Shane Cooney was uh, a new defender. He'd an injured David Burke. He'd a uh, Joel Canning, I'd say, who probably wasn't fully fit last year. Um, and look, look at it this year now. You have a Canning who's fully fit. You have your Cottle Mannion obviously went off, and that I, I wonder how much did Cottle Mannion's departure in the All Ireland semi final take away from him because in that game they were thinking that they were going to hurt Galway from out the pitch, and then all of a sudden one of the guys that could hurt the most from out the pitch who potentially could have hit three or four from play and maybe tipped the balance was gone off. And then Joe Canning has gone off at the end of the game as well. Um, So just a a quick one as well, Shane. I do think it's interesting with Evan Nyland. I'm not saying Evan Nyland is going to be next Joe Canning or anything like that. He's he's not. He's He's a very, very good player. But I do think the succession kind of planning with him has been interesting, uh, particularly under O'Neill. Played a few league games last year. 
uh, came on the Oller in semi final, had a big free to hit, put it over, has started a good few league games this year where he had the responsibility to free take and um and like he's he's it's like Evan Evan Comerford uh replacing Stephen Cluxton. He's just been kind of given time here, given time there, so that when ever Canning walks away, be it at the end of this year or at the end of next year or the year after, he'll be ready to step into that mantle and will have have the muscle memory almost of doing the things that he's going to need to do at the highest level. And he's going to be a bit older as well. He's going to be 23 or 24 probably, and he'll be more ready to take on that responsibility as well. So I think that's been smart. Yeah, uh, Sean Sully, I think Galway will become much more threatening if they persist with Joe at 14. His power and goal threat is unstoppable. I would actually counter that by, well, like, obviously he hasn't scored a, a goal in the championship since 2016, unless I've missed something from, from 2020. I'm not sure that I have. I, no. I actually have, and I mean from play now, obviously. But I think that his biggest threat in terms of goal or coming through is when he is solo and with the ball from deep, where he's coming onto the ball which you don't really do that often at full forward because you're standing there 14 yards out or whatever and you're waiting for a delivery to come to you and turn and then go. So I think, would I rather him having to go collect the ball, turn and go, or would I rather him coming off the shoulder through the half forward then? I think I'd rather the latter. And even we saw that against Watford as he helped turn that game there. Um, and was it that brilliant solo through and flick over the top that allowed, was it Connor Cooney or the block shot and then the... Then, then the rebound was knocked in. So I kind of rather in that way. But anyway, get your thoughts in. I think I just about nudge for a, a Galway um, victory here. Could be by four or five for a finish. But I'm back in Dublin to give a performance here. And obviously part of me is just hoping that too. But um, that's kind of the way I'm looking for this one here. Just a reminder, we're, uh, we're on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Please get your comments in. We'd be happy to bring them up on screen and talk about them. Also, if you want to get this on podcast, audio podcast, go and subscribe to the Our Game Supporters Club on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash our game. And if you want to get a fundraiser done for your club this year, please uh, get in contact. Events at ourgame.ie and we'll help run a live show for you and should generate thousands of quid. Kilkenny against Wexford this weekend. Davy against Cody. Maybe both in their last years. You know, if, if things went particularly poorly, it could be that way. Well, a defeat for either of them, and uh, I, like it's mad to say it, but a defeat for Cody, and you think maybe the, the wagons are starting to circle in Kilkenny, depending on the, na the nature of the defeat. Um, there has been a lot of talk, more talk over the winter maybe than there has ever been probably before. Um, and then Davey, he said it might not be his last year, but you know, if they're to to limp out of the Leinster Championship for the second year in a row and go to, into the qualifiers with not too much optimism, then all of a sudden you're thinking, you're thinking this could be not the final kind of death knell, but it could be one and a, a nail in the coffin for either of them. And that seems mad to say it with, with Cody, with, with what he's won, but it's, it's a huge game for both. And again, the complexion of this game does change with... Uh, that's an interesting <laughs> use as part of the Kilkenny v Wexford the banished or relegation match yeah but at least we know other people are, are thinking it as well but um, Wexford the complexion of this game does change by the fact that Wexford came in last week and delivered a big performance fair enough uh, Leash offered very very little resistance mm. and played very negatively but Wexford had all their key men on the pitch and all their key men playing well Chim was influential uh Conor McDonald, who who has turned into a fair specimen over the last four or five months, he's got himself really, really, really fit and really mobile now, and maybe can play even in the half hour line at different stages. Rory O'Connor was bouncing, Kevin Foley was bouncing, Matt O'Hanlon was bouncing, Liam Ryan. They're the pillars of this team. If they're all on the pitch together and they're all fit and they're all flying, Wexford will be hard beaten. So I think they needed that sort of a win last weekend. And they're coming into this game full of confidence. And there's so much on the line. We talked about the two managers. So much on the line for both teams. Like, get into a Leinster final and you're guaranteed an All-Ireland quarter final at least. Uh, lose on Saturday and, you know, you could meet a Waterford or you could get a very, very tough draw in the qualifiers and you could be in bother. Yeah, and the more I think back on that Wexford Limerick or Wexford Kilkenny game down in Nolan Park, maybe a month or so ago, and Adrian Ronan, who was doing co commentary for or for commentary for KCLR at the time, said it was more tickling than tackling that Wexford were doing that day. Like they didn't start with Kevin Foley, didn't start with uh, Conor McDonald. I'm not a hundred percent sure if they started with Lee Chin or not. I think they mightn't have, but they down by fourteen at half time. Absolutely terrible performance. Second half, they brought the boys off the bench. And they won that second half. I'm starting to think a real pup was sold there. 
and that Wexford aren't as bad as that looked. And, you know, we were obviously building that on top of what, what they did in 2020, which was lose their two championship games to, to Galway and Clare by a combined 22 points. They, like, they looked like a terrible team, and it was really, really easy to start to think, right, this team is sort of circling the wagon, uh, or sorry, circling the drain heading into this year. But now I'm starting to buy into Wexford a little bit. I mean, just leash... Like, they were really poor. I mean, I, I don't want to be insulting, but, you know, that's not Liam McCarthy-level hurling, the way they kind of performed or what they were able to produce. They just leave phys physically off it. They can all hurl. They always can hurl. But they just seem tactically off it, physically off it. Maybe it was the impossible kind of matchup for them and being a little bit harsh on, on Cheddar there. But they did seem a nice bit off it. Um, and I think, that, I think Wexford, even though they lost that league match by a fair scoreline, I think they nearly go in as favourites here because... Like Kilkenny, we, we, I think we had thought, you know, Kilkenny are still Kilkenny. They're, they're going well here on the basis of their, their league performances and the fact that they were getting their wins. But when you reflect on Division 1B, it's nowhere near as strong as Division 1A. I mean, just because uh, basically Leash are in there, Antrim are in there, Clare aren't necessarily considered All-Ireland winner uh, contenders, even though maybe they're kind of changing a few uh, tunes lately. Dublin aren't considered All-Ireland contenders. Wexford weren't necessarily considered contenders, plus they sold as a pup that day. Their players looked jaded. And the way Kilkenny collapsed against Clare at Cusick Park, I think my perceptions have sort of changed. And I wonder even with Kilkenny folk, and please get your comments in and disabuse me if you think I'm wrong, I'm starting to think of Wexford as the favourite, sir. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, I would have been negative enough about Wexford maybe up until last weekend. And I'm... I'm reticent to to take too much stock on it, but you do have to take some stock on it. Um, in fairness, we don't know we don't know much about what's going on in Kilkenny at the moment. It's been it's been very very quiet. Uh, I believe Walter broke his nose in that last game against Clare, and there was talk of a bit of a concussion. I'm not 100 percent sure that Conor Delaney, I believe, had another setback with his quad. Doesn't look like he'll be playing championship this year. Richie Hogan didn't feature throughout the league. We don't know whether he's going to be. Uh, playing a part uh, it'll be interesting we'll only know when we see the 26 at the weekend uh, something I still can't get my head around is how Joey Holden's not in this Kilkenny team I, I cannot get my head around how he's not playing either cornerback or wingback in this team to me he's one of their one of their better defenders and you know exactly what you're going to get out of him a given day Adrian Mullen coming back is big for them he had a bit picked up a bit of a knock against Clare in the last game yeah, yeah. I believe, believe he's fit to play uh, Darren Mullen who played very little league is fit to play as well and could potentially come in at wing or cornerback, but like we're, we're talking about, you know, wings and cornerbacks and midfield there. Like we don't know who's going to be who the two starting cornerbacks are going to be. We don't know who the starting wingbacks are going to be. We don't know who the starting midfielders are going to be. So there are definitely um, some question marks over Kilkenny. That, uh, you know, the solidity of it. We just don't know who's going to be playing in those positions. And I'm surprised they went the whole way throughout the league without uh, forming, I suppose, a, you know, a really solid back nine that you're going to know who's going to be playing in all those those positions. Um, so it's going to be really, really interesting this weekend. Uh, and again, like I presume we're going to see Matt O'Hanlon's role on TJ Reid being reprised. I'd be amazed if, if we don't, because it's just worked so well down through the years. Um, so you'd imagine Matt O'Hanlon's going to pick him up again. And you just wonder, you know, like, and say James Bergen maybe emerged a small bit and Billy Ryan to some extent through the league, but you just wonder who are the lads that are going to pick up the slack uh, yeah. well, outside of TJ. Wally did return to form a little bit when he came in against Clare before the, the broken nose. I think Adrian Mullen was doing well also. He went off just before half time at that stage. Uh, Niall, Brazel, a... Niall Brazel has left the squad as well, Shane. He came on in the Leinster final last year and actually set up a score and he came on the All Ireland semi final last year. Uh, so as well, so that's someone who was in the mix who has left the panel. Just an interesting question. He came on against Clare well. as well, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So he's actually left the panel since. Um, you know, you know the way uh, consistency was always the the pillar of Brian Cody's teams. But when you look at like 2019, you know, a big big result against Limerick, mm -hmm. and then you know a very very poor All Ireland final performance. You can take into the red the red card into account or not, whatever you whatever you like. But then a big kind of a big fifteen minutes against Galway to win Leinster, and then you know 
a collapse against Waterford, having collapsed. So we're not seeing Dublin. seventy minute performances, what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Well, we're, yeah. we're not. Like when was when's the last the last seventy minute performance from Kilkenny in a big game is probably the All Ireland semi final in twenty nineteen. And then you know, unlike Kilkenny teams, they didn't back it up in the final. They didn't back up the Leinster final performance in, in the second half against Waterford at all having non delivered against Dublin in that second half as well. And so that's definitely that definitely has to be a worry. Yeah, Henry Sheffield had said when we interviewed him at a press meeting not so long ago that he thinks that the the meltdowns were in the rearview mirror. Maybe they are and this is the perfect game to sort of prove that because Wexford will feel that they're very much, you know, right there on their level even if they're just as inconsistent. But maybe yeah, like it's a very fair point. Like Kilkenny team were battering teams for 70 minutes for years when they were very clearly way ahead of the rest of the, the pack at that stage. But maybe it's more difficult now to, to beat a team for 70 minutes. Limerick do it fairly convincingly at times. But it's not, that, like, is it that Kilkenny no longer perform to their kind of level for 70 minutes, even if the other team's level rises above it? Is that they're, within the 70 minutes, kind of dipping? So, like, before you were like, you know what you'll get out of Kenny players. They'll play hard for 70 minutes. That's, they'll be competitive and that's it. So, are they now kind of having dips in that within games? Like, even I'm looking at the last, uh, at the second half against uh, Clare here. And for the last, I think, 10 minutes, like, they had very few chances. They had a wide from Park Walsh. They had a point from Owen Cody. TJ Reid strangely missed a one-on-one -on -one against Aver Quilligan. That was a good save now, but strangely missed that. Martin Keown was hooped. And then Liam Blanchfield hit a wide as well. And meanwhile, Clare were putting up score after score. One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six or seven scores there in the last 10 minutes. Completely took over a game. And even just the fact that Clare were able to solo up the centre of them. David Reedy's goal being a, a perfect example, knocked it into the top corner. Tony Kelly was able to come through uh, untouched, more or less, and slam one into the top corner. So was that kind of part of it now, that they're, they're no longer beating teams for 70 minutes? And if you can keep Porrick Walsh out of the game, obviously a, su a superstar in hurling sense over the last number of years, which Clare managed to do, they didn't make a hero out of him, that, the, that there's a, a dearth of quality around the rest of the field. And, you know, we've kind of talked about their entire backline and midfield is probably a huge amount of those players are probably wing backs that are repurposed for other positions. So, uh, Kilkenny fa folk, please get your comments in and let us know what you think. But this is just kind of us kind of teasing out what we think is happening with Kilkenny and why they're not necessarily uh, dominating as they were. Well, it's funny, like you kind of, we were just, when we were chatting uh, off air, you kind of just said, which team has more flaws? And, you know, you know, when you put it, when you put it out there, you're probably saying, okay, we don't know who the two Kilkenny cornerbacks are going to be. We won't be sure who the wingbacks are going to be. We won't be sure who's going to be midfield. We're not sure who's going to assist TJ, who, who's, who is definitely going to offer something concrete that's going to, like, something Billy Ryan could offer it on a day, Owen Cody could offer it on another day. So we're, we're not sure. So there's definitely a lot of question marks over Kilkenny. Now, in fairness to them, the question marks have generally gotten definitive answers down through the years. And like I, I actually, this is in this recent is, years though. In recent yeah. years, they haven't because they collapsed last year against Watford, hammered the All Ireland the year before. Uh, I suppose like if I'm thinking of the All Ireland semi final in 2019, like I totally written off Kilkenny going into that game, and mm. then all of a sudden they deliver probably probably the, one of the most complete performances of the last of the last couple of years. There's probably I, I I'd be and really got a lucky sideline call at the end. Yeah, okay. Okay, all right. Yeah. Mr. Tip, Mr. Tipperary. Um I just I was actually just going to check the odds of uh Kilkenny Wexford because I thought because I thought it was interesting to see. Um and I can't actually find it at the moment, but that's a real 50 50 Thanks for game. that information. That's very Yeah, I, I I'll get I'll get it in, I'll get it in a second here. I'm trying to double job and as you know, men can not do two things at once. So Ooh. talking and trying to look something up on the internet at the same time is not possible, but Well, I'll run it, through a few comments if you want to have a look yeah. at that there. And John S has said Davy finished in Wexford this year, I think. I think Davy might say he'll be back, but I think public opinion won't be there from him from what I see down here unless we reach a semi-final at least that is. And I wonder obviously he's talking about an all Ireland semi-final because they're already in Leinster semi-final. Sean Sully, as much as Kilkenny did collapse against Clare, they're still very capable of bouncing back, much like how Limerick did with Cork. And you know, that is true, like in the space of a week or two weeks, get some heavy training done, all of a sudden there's a bounce to you. Dermot O'Keefe is the perfect example. He looks stuck to the floor during the league and I thought, is he kind of coming towards the tail end of his career? Then after the first minute or two against Leash, I saw him burning up the field with a ball. And this, 
it's very specifically watching Jermot O'Keefe with searing pace against Leash that confirmed to me that Leash sold or that Wexford sold as a pup during the league. Like that, there's a freshness there now again. They were obviously going through a heavy, heavy, heavy training. Uh, Patrick Hickey, that's Kilkenny. You think they're not um, as good, and then they blow teams away. Cody last dance this year. Maybe they'll be fired up. James Murphy, big worry as a Kilkenny man if Connor Delaney can't play this weekend. Joy Holden, very hard done by the whole time. Vast majority thing, standout club defender in Club Hurling and has done very little uh, wrong. Donald Farrell, the big difference with Kilkenny now versus 10 years ago is how many of their starting 15 would make any team in the country. 10 years ago, it was probably 11. Now it is three. So yeah, we've talked about that. Yeah, like it's Murphy, it's Murphy, Park, Walsh and TJ. And outside of that, you're really struggling. Shane, interestingly, Kilkenny are four to nine favourites to win that game. Wexford are two to one. Uh, I thought it'd be much tighter than that. Now is there a handicap say. on it? Is two points or something like that? Uh, I think it's two points. Yeah, like if you were to say, if you were to say, um, what's the value there? Three points actually. Um, so you'd have to say from uh, the middle on that. Yeah, from uh, yeah, you'd well, it would be a double whammy. Be Kilkenny been beaten. Just like, all I could think of was your man from Anchorman coming in with a big whammy on the screen. <laughs> Kilkenny beaten, and you make a few quid. But Wexford are definitely. <laughs> what about Father Ted, I know you love it. Uh, they're where they're putting a bet on it for the was it the Eurovision or some old contest rather than they go put on three pounds, four pounds, yeah, yeah. five, about pounds? five pounds. <laughs> yeah, it's with it's with Father Dick Byrne. Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just I, I would have thought it was more of a, an even game than that, more of a 50 50 game. Yeah. But uh, as, as you say, maybe Davy has sold us a pup, maybe, maybe. Cody's happy with all this kind of negative talk about Kilkenny and they'll deliver a big performance. I think there's so many unknowns in this game above any other game this weekend. It's very hard to confidently call it. Like, it is very... I, and, and to be honest with you, like, and you, you know I normally will do this. Like, I do think Kilkenny will win. I do think they'll find they'll find a way to win and it could, they could deliver a defiant performance. Will they win Leinster? I don't think so. Will they... Uh, being an all Ireland final at the end of the year, I don't think so, but I think they might just have enough for Wexford at the weekend. She you have black and amber running through your awfully veins, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but who's going to man mark Rory O'Connor? He's in, like you talked, we talked about Cahill O'Mannion being, Cahill O'Mannion being in her third year form. Rory O'Connor is in her third year form. I don't know if Wexford will get far enough for him to be able to realise that, but I think the way he's playing at the moment, the way he's moving, he's looking absolutely unbelievable, which, you know, if the likes of Dermot O'Keefe looked a little bit laboured during the league, how fit really is Rory O'Connor that he can still look fresh as a daisy going through the training that I suspect that they were going through. So does Brian Cody pick matchups for, for Lee Chin, for Connor McDonald, Rory O'Connor, and just stick with them throughout the game? And then I'm wondering, does that create space for the likes of Paul Morris, who's one of these underrated players who he's always able to snipe a point or two? And then, like, is Jack O'Connor going to start or come off the bench? And, like, who are going to be the ball carriers up through the middle? And what will Kevin Foley, you know, what do they do about Kevin Foley? Do they try and occupy him to some degree? Or am I thinking about far too much about Brian Cody worrying about Wexford when, you know, maybe he'll just say, we'll just do our thing? No, uh, I no, I think there'd be a degree of worry. I definitely think someone will, will be detailed to Mark Chin. Potentially Connor Brown, if he's playing wing back, could pick up up chain and probably one of the few guys that be able to stay with him physically. You think Hugh Lawler matches up reasonably well with Conor McDonald as well. Big, rangy, athletic player. But that does leave the conundrum of, of who picks up Rory O'Connor. Um, to be honest, if, if Joey Holden was on the pitch, I'd be more than happy with him picking up uh, most, Wexford, most Wexford attackers. But I, it doesn't look like he's going to be playing. So I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think... Davies' championship record against Cody as well is two wins, uh, a draw, and a loss. So, like, there's not too many... As Wexford Michael... manager. Yeah, as Wexford manager, yeah. So, I, I think outside of Michal Dunahu, I think he's probably one of the most successful championship managers against Cody. And Cody has, Cody's Kilkenny teams have generally struggled a lot with the sweeper. Uh, so, it'll be interesting to see what they do to work around that. Um, because if TJ is in around centre forward and in around Kevin Foley, it just means there's two men in around him, makes it uh, more difficult for him to have an influence on the game. Will he end up in the full forward line? Will he be out in the wing, or will they try and pull him out the pitch? Uh, so many, so many really, really inter interesting questions that need to be answered. Yeah, and will will TJ Reid play closer to goal or further out the field? You know, the man is 34 later in the year. He can't have Everton thrown up on his back all the time. So own Cody, Adrian Mullen, they'll all have to really pitch in in this game. Actually, I wonder who has the best uh, championship record on um, on Brian Cody. What's Liam Sheedy? So they played in two I, I, Yeah, I think Donahue's is the best. Yeah. Because uh, Dun Donahue beat him in 
Uh, they beat them in Nolan Park. They beat them in uh, the Leinster final replay in Turles. Uh, I don't know if, if Donahue, Donahue lost to him once in 15 in the Leinster final. Uh, he definitely has a positive well, no, record he, over him. He wasn't manager in 15. Anthony Cunningham was manager Sorry, 15. 16. Six, 16. Yeah. And he beat him in 17 and 19. And did they play in 18, actually? Uh, did they play in Salt Hill and beat him well uh, in 18? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, he's three championship wins over him, yeah. And let's see, Liam Sheedy. So 2008, they didn't meet. 2009... That was that classic All Ireland final. So that's one for Cody. 2010, I think we all remember what happened there. Then obviously Sheedy went away for a decade, came back. 2019, I think we all know what happened there. So two one to Sheedy there actually. So a couple of a couple of managers are. Ahead that's all in recent years, Shane. No one would have like very few would have had a positive record until the last couple of years. Yeah, and uh, just a reminder: if you want to get this podcast with audio, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. And a reminder: we're brought to you by Torpy's Bamboo Stick. If you want to get that extra drive into it, uh, get that bamboo stick and go use the promo code our game, and you'll get ten percent off. The link is in the video description. Kev Kyo now, as we're going on to the Munster Championship, he uh, said, will RT be calling the outcomes of games this weekend with 20 minutes to go again? Kev actually emailed me a screenshot uh, in the middle of the Clare Waterford game. It had uh, kind of the lineup for next Sunday and it had Tipperary versus Clare. So the game wasn't even over and they were advertising Tip versus Clare the following week. Uh, Jimmy Barry Murphy beat Cody twice, I think, there in, in their two meetings. I'm trying to think if they play it other than that. And somebody, please get back to us and let us know if you have any um, any extra info on that. The Munster semi-finals this weekend. Let's talk about a bit of Munster. Can I welcome you into Munster for a, oh, a minute there, Michael? It says, it says the man up in, sitting in up in Haddington Road in Dublin. <laughs> yeah, but look, I'd be, I'd be driving home to to, uh, to Burris Lee over the weekend. I'd be calling into many. Uh, get another apple tart. The one she gave me last weekend was unbelievable. I've a Hard tiny beat. sliver left downstairs and going straight into the gut there and white <laughs> into the joy pouch. Limerick against Cork will start off down the good field in Turles, seven o'clock Saturday night. Will Cork persist with what got them an awful bait in during the league? That I think short, they will. Short turn, yeah. They have no choice. I think they will, like, yeah, like if, if you're gonna revert back to going long, like who are they gonna hit it long to? Um, Seamus Harnady in order for Cork to win uh, and them going long even at any stage it's Harnady's going to have to play and he's going to have to play very well um, but I do I definitely think they'll persist with it will they be maybe as naive as they were that evening in uh, the Gaelic grounds I doubt it um, what do you mean by naive? Ah, just like playing playing the sharp puck out and Limerick pressing up on top of them and really like there's, there's times when like if, if you know Limerick are going to press straight away you're going to have to find the ball you're going to have to avoid the full back line sometimes. Like, I'll put it this way. If you're managing a team or coaching a team or if you're playing another team, you're happy enough for the keeper to go to the full back line, are you not? Generally, Generally yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. So, so like, so like, but what you're not happy with is if, you know, a keeper is able to find a 70 or 80 yard pass, then all of a sudden, uh, there's a lot less pressure on if they do get the ball to hand. So I do think they're going to need to find a few of those balls. They can't just all go to the full back line and run it from there. Particularly, no being smart at you, particularly on what's probably going to be, you know, a blazing summer's evening. It's just not possible to 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 keep doing that, to keep running ball. And particularly, it saps energy out of you uh, mentally as well if the ball is turned over. So I think Patrick Collins, who I presume is going to be uh, between the nets, will be trying to find a 70 or 80 yard ball out to maybe, maybe, maybe Horgan might play a bit further out the pitch um, or spend some time out the pitch and they might try and find him in areas like that. Find uh, Shane Kingston, Robbie O'Flynn in areas like that. They have to, it's, it's, the key word I think is there's going to have to be variety. They can, they can go short sometimes. They can go medium range sometimes. They're going to have to go along the odd time as well. If they go along, if Harnady is playing, I do expect most of the ball to be down around him. But they're just going to have to be that bit more variety. Um, they're just going to have to keep Limerick guessing. The other, the, the last night it was just uh, they played ball to the full back line uh, reg regularly at the start. It was turned over. Then they went long. Limerick knew exactly what they were going to do. Um, so their cards are well marked on that front. They just need to bring a bit more variety to the table. There's five or six of the guys who started in the Gaelic rounds in that league game that I think won't. No, won't, definitely point. won't start here and yeah. might not see game time at all. Um, but I, 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 look, I said it before, I think Kieran Kingston and his management team decided we're going to put these players out, come hell or high water, we're going to play this way, we're going to go with the short game. And if this goes badly, at least they'll know what to expect the next time. They'll have time to process it. 
maybe they'll, you know, because a lot of teams do visualization, this is what I'm going to face the next time, and then sort of react to that and come up with their, their solutions. And maybe the team will sit, like, they did the worst case scenario. And once you find out what the worst case scenario is, you can kind of plan for it the next time. Exactly. And they brought on at halftime that day, I think, didn't they bring on Patrick Horgan at halftime? And Luke Mead, yeah. And, and Luke, Luke Mead as well, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Cashman came on as well. So he fairly changed things around. And I think they were much, they were much, much better in the second half of that game. So I think they'll persist with that. And I expect them to play pretty well here. Uh, the problem with some of these Cork teams is they're, they're all icing and no cake. And last 15 or 16 years, I think that's probably been the case a little bit too often. I think there is a little bit more to this Cork team. But they need to get the right lads on the ball coming out with it. Like Damien Cahalan is always unbelievably willing to go and get the ball. And his athleticism means he's brilliant at running off the shoulder. But they need more lads doing that and more lads that they probably want on the ball a bit more regularly doing that as well. So a comment coming in here from Tyg, uh, uh, Tyg Fanning. I expect Cork to have a right goal against Limerick, really attack the full back line and get a few goals. I'm cautiously optimistic about a Cork win. Limerick, Limerick obviously favourite. So. But I actually don't think it's about attacking the full back line. You need to attack, you need to attack Limerick's half forward line. I mean, hammer to hammer, really. Like, Grode Hegarty didn't play in that league game. He didn't start that league game anyway. Tom Morris, he did. But I need, think they need to be able to get the ball, turn and actually get past them and then have the runners off the shoulder. And if they can do that and run at their half forward line, which or half back line, which very few have been able to do outside of maybe Cork in the last few years, then I think they get joy for the inside line because Patrick Horgan's getting the ball in a little bit more space. So I think it's winning the battle and further out the field means that you'll be able to have those matchups inside. Yeah, I know. I'd agree with you. If, if they're losing, you know, if their half back line is struggling, they're going to be on the back foot. If they can even break even uh, in the half back line, I think they have a they have a very good chance to uh, put Limerick on the back foot in defence. Like, look at like I'm not sure if Rich English starts at the weekend. Uh, Jack O'Connor, I think what he what he did to him in that league game in in the Gaelic Crowns might have set off a few alarm bells. The, just the, the pace and how easily maybe he was able to round them. Uh, wouldn't be that surprised if it was Finn, Dan Morrissey and, and uh, Barry Nash, the same full back line as last year, even though even though English is fit. Uh, there's definitely goals to be got, got and Cork are keen to get to raise green flags. I think they'll raise I think they'll raise minimum of two green flags, but I still think I still think they'll be beaten. But I think as uh, as Tyg said there, I think they'll really hop off Limerick. I think they'll give them a right good game. I think this could be a real rip roaring game as well. Uh, if anything, like as you said, their their card was really well marked in that league game. It's I think it's great for so many things to go wrong in a game. I yeah. actually genuinely because it's not as if you know things have been going absolutely stink up until that in the league. Things have been going well. All of a sudden, you raised all these problems, and like okay, all these problems are on the table for us now, and we've got a month to figure them out. And yeah. uh, I and I think they will have figured an awful lot of them out. And I think the ver variety is important. I think one of the viewers said that that Bill Cooper might be fit. J very very difficult having played no league. To, to yeah. come in, to come in and play. Same with Colum Spillane. I believe he's back in the mix again. But like, to be fair to Colum and with most players at county level, like last year he missed a good bit of action and came in, and he wasn't himself really. I think he's the sort of player that needs a bit of game time under his belt. There would be good options uh, going forward over the coming weeks, but I'm not so sure about Saturday night. Interesting as well. I was chatting to Kieran Carey during the week. He's fully convinced that that Cottle O'Neill would play a massive role in the championship for Limerick really? and could could potentially play a big role even on Saturday night. Uh, and obviously, I always I always take on board what someone like him is saying. You are there is like his proximity to Keane Lynch and the fact that he's obviously chatting to him a bit. He's his uncle, obviously. He knows maybe what's going on a bit more than than most of us. And it's probably up top where there's more likely to be an option coming in. And maybe like Graham Mulcahy, you'd say he probably will start, I'd say. But there's definitely more options for guys coming off the bench in the attack, you'd say, more so than at the back. Uh, that, they do have plenty of options at the back. But just what I'm saying is the forwards are more likely to tire and maybe not be going as well. And lads are going to be brought in in the attack. So be interesting to see if he plays. He's, 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 he's young, uh, he's raw enough, but he's got serious ability. Do you know, when I'm looking at my notes from that game and... Another thing we talked about was that Limerick created three many three times as many ch uh, chances in the first quarter of the game, nineteen to six. Some of the other things that I noted were that <clears throat> this was Keen Lynch 
re-announcing himself for this season because he'd had a quiet enough uh, couple of games before that, maybe been having his position switched from game to game. And he was up against Mark Coleman. Will King Will Kingston allow that matchup to happen again? I think maybe John Kiley will have seen it and said, yeah, I want a little bit more of that. He won't allow... Mark Coleman followed Lynch the last day, which is very, which was strange, I thought. And I thought they were, as the... You know, as they used to say on Biker Grove, I think he was playing a bit of silly beggars. I, genu- I genuinely do. I, I don't. Was the cup I, being sold? Potentially. Like, will Mark Coleman follow Keen Lynch around the field? Not. I, I can't see it. He'll, he'll sit back in front of the full back line, like an orchestra back there. Can't see him following Keen Lynch everywhere like he did do it that day. I, I can't see it. As you're talking about which team learned more from that game, I think Cork learned an awful lot. Interesting. John Milan's column about a week after that game. He, I, I don't know whether this has happened and maybe it's just uh, it's kind of wishful thinking or something or, but he, he, th- he thought that potentially that, that they could push uh, Tim O'Mahony who might play a wing back or midfield that they could potentially push him up under their own puck out as an as an as an option for a long ball, and he said potentially if uh, if Colin Spillane or someone came back in that if Catalan was playing wing back that potentially again they could push him up under a puck up uh, not under all of their puck outs, but that just to op- offer that bit of variety and a bit more physical bulk and strength under the puck out, and he actually said that he thought Shane Kingston and Robbie O'Flynn might even drop back into the wing back positions for a couple of puck outs. But it'd be interesting to see, maybe he knows something that the rest of us don't. But it definitely would have been an interesting to be a fly in the wall in Parky Cueve over the last couple of weeks. They're definitely going to bring a lot different than they did to the Gaelic grounds that night. And I think that's from a you know a spectator's point of view, it's really intriguing to see what they'll throw at them because they do have a lot of the tools that could trouble them, Rick. And wasn't it Davy Fitz who used to push Conor Cleary up wing forward and hit puck outs at him yeah. when he was still mm-hmm. over Clare? Um, one, a couple of the other things that stood out from that league game was Cork were going for goals. I, th- and I think they were tra- very much trying to test what frailties are in that back line for Limerick. I remember a couple of times I was looking at what Shane Kingston did and I wasn't entirely sure if he was making the right decisions, but maybe they were under instruction to go for goals as often as, as possible. They definitely butchered a few goal scoring chances as well. So, yeah, just kind of, you just wonder. I think we're all like you and I are both going to back Limerick to win this game. But I think Limerick will, or Cork will want to see, right, even if we don't win this game, how much more can we develop playing against the very best team and the most, I don't mean this as an insult, but systematic team out there and that, like, what team understands exactly the game plan better than they do? I think per, pretty much nobody. And even like, as a Tipperary person, assuming that you get over. Uh, Clare, which is obviously going to be a tough game, but if you get over it, I think even in Tipperary, not everyone is thinking about beating Limerick, but at least learning enough when you play them so that you're kind of more armed for the game after that again. And look, maybe Tip don't beat Clare, but anyway, that's just the point being made. Uh, Spager, what do you lads uh, think about Cork's propensity to summon virtuoso early season performances? Why do they seem to struggle as the year wears on? What do you uh, think? Any thoughts yeah. on that? They obviously beat Limerick a couple of years ago in the first in their second game. Actually, after being hammered by Tip the, the week before. Yeah, like what are the other? What are the other? I'd like to see the examples of the other virtuoso early season performances. Oh, winning a few a few uh, monster titles there in recent years. Mate. Perhaps he's referring to that. Uh, Cork to come close, but Limerick will do it. Says Luke Hurley, and he adds that it'll be Cork two sixteen, Limerick twenty four. That would kind of buck the trend of the the scoring. Big we've time. Seen. Yeah. Big time. Yeah, I'd say more Cork. It could be Cork two twenty two, Limerick. Uh, Limerick could end up with thirty something points. You just you just wouldn't yeah. know. J Wall seven. I could see Cork having a right go with Declan Hannon. Once they break the line and put Hannon on the back foot, they'll have a real chance with the pace they have. But then again, how often do teams get to do that? Cork, Dublin, Wexford, and Tip on uh, the bet, and you heard it here first, lads. Donald Farrell. How about Richie English, Sean Finn, Barry Nash, Dan Morrissey back out to left half back, Keen Lynch back to midfield, and Kyle Hayes to centre forward. I can see Kyle Hayes staying at wing back. He's just becoming such a weapon there. And maybe of all the things we've talked about, he's possibly one that we really haven't talked about. Who, who do you think would even be on his wing? Would uh, Shane Kingston go on his wing and be able to take him both ways? Oh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. um, Kingston is lightning, but God, when K- Hayes gets those legs churning, he's hard to keep it. Yeah, it's, it's not, like, neither of them are probably going to burn each other, I'd say. Uh, that's going to be really interesting. Uh Maybe they'd try and put even a, a spoiler. Maybe Harnady would, would go out there and try and make... Don't make, want to the pace for him. Yeah, p- potentially not, but he could do a good bit of damage. Uh, he could be, do a double, good bit of damage at the other end and maybe someone else takes his when he's going... You know, you've often... 
seen a yourself that you know if if he goes past the sixty five, you're you're picking him up uh, almost like a runner is picking him up. But yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things in it. I think I was chatting to Kieran Carey the other day, and he kind of he kind of summed up kind of I think what a lot of people think about the match, maybe outside of Cork. And he just said Cork are trying to tweak their game, and with Dolan O'Grady involved, he'll be teaching them all the time. Will it be good enough? I'm genuinely not convinced yet. And yet, I think is the big word. I think. I think we're all think there's a lot of potential there, but that maybe this might come a small bit soon. Um, he just said, I haven't seen enough of it, but they do potentially have the forwards that are capable of putting our backs uh, under pressure. I wouldn't judge the league games because Cork were very under strength, but if they do get into a bit of momentum, they could rattle Limerick, although I do fancy Limerick to come away with a four or five point win. Mightn't be four or five points, but I do, uh, in, a, in around that I'd say as well. But I'm expecting a real competitive game, and I'm expecting Limerick to be uncomfortable at different stages. Mm. And uh, there was a comment there about whether Cork have the bench. I think the likes of Alan Connolly now is definitely developing himself. And we've named so many good forwards there between, you know, Horgan, Hernady, uh, Luke Mead is obviously going to play. Alan Cadigan. Flynn, Alan Cadigan. Like, there are definitely forwards <laughs> on the bench. I don't know if there are enough kind of backup in other parts of the field. So if plan A doesn't work, I mean, there was another comment there about Mark Coleman. I must uh, just have a just a quick one, Shane, on the forwards you mentioned there. There's just a bit of ignorance needed mixed with that class. There's just a bit of like imagine a, just say a fit Bonner matter was with Cork or you know a fit Dan McCormack. Just that bit of ignorance and that bit of brawn that will do an awful lot of work that will allow other lads to flourish. And then of course Dara Fitzgibbon. We haven't even talked about his attack and threat and carrying the ball. So. There's a lot of good about this uh, Cork team, but it comes back to the whole idea, will it be all icing and no cake? Sean Sully, would Mark Coleman be able to have the time on the ball that he needs to play his type of quarterback role? I think not. Whether it's David Reedy or Keane Lynch, he'll be pressed and pressed. And obviously, like he was, I thought he was quite good at that sweeper role in 2018, I think, in that game down in Parky Cueve. But he did get turned over once or twice. I think that just kind of, that almost made it look like he'd had a bad performance. But I still thought he was quite good. Uh, Kingston and Hayes could well cancel each other out. That would be a more significant loss to Cork than Limerick. I'm not actually entirely sure no, I agree with that. Yeah, I wouldn't agree with that now, to be honest with you. If Hayes has kept quiet, uh, even if they cancel each other out, I think that's a, that's a plus for Cork, I have to say. Because there's other guys that can do the damage there for Cork. I uh, wouldn't be surprised if Tim O'Mahony was deployed at wing forward on Hayes to match him in the air and curb his influence going forward. Don't don't see that happening myself. I can see physically, like you, on the face foot, I can see that working, but he hasn't played there during the league. He obviously has played as a forward and was full forward for the under 21s a few years back, but couldn't see it happening. I'm not sure. I think you'd need to road test that one. I think um, it's interesting, Shane. Uh, like there's something about Cork, as I said, about like what I'd love to know what they've been doing in Parky Creek. Like, remember the time they all. 14 of them more red helmets for a championship game even they, they just they do they just come out with kind of weird things i think that just spice things up a bit and i do i'm expecting some interesting tactics uh, i think as i said i think they learned more than limerick when they met in the league and maybe they'll all be wearing red helmets at the weekend and they'll be confused in limerick so let's call it Let's call it. Uh, and let, you know what? We're both going to go Limerick, I think, because we're too afraid to go Cork, even if we do think, that, you know, because we can't, I don't think we necessarily trust them. But Limerick by how many? Uh, I'd say probably Limerick by four to six, I would say. And, yeah. I, and I think that's, to me, in my head, that's an arm's length four to six. That's Limerick being up by uh, three or four or five points nearly the whole way after the first 50 or 20 minutes and just maintaining that gap rather than you know, it been a really, really, it been a draw game with a minute to go and Limerick getting a goal or a couple of points. I think they'll just have them, like four or five points for this, and isn't really arms length in hurling, I suppose, but I think they'll just have that gap. Maybe after the first quarter onwards, they'll be able to maintain that gap. That's what's yeah. in my head anyway. I think there's a chance of a beating here. There is a chance, but I just don't think, I think Cork will give this a right rattle. And um, I think it's certainly in the first 20, 25 minutes, but I think you might be right uh, with them pulling away a small bit, with um, with Limerick pulling away a small bit. Liam O'Callaghan doesn't agree. He says uh, Cork 319, Limerick 25 points. So that would be a win for the Rebels. Yeah, I think in the last 10 minutes, I think Limerick are going to have a one. And I think they'll win by, I think they'll win by probably five as well. I, I couldn't really disagree with you too much. Here's one for you, Shane. Yeah. Both, both Limerick and Cork, are, both Limerick and Kilkenny are both four to nine to win their matches. Like I know who I'd want to have as a four to nine shot. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be taking Limerick every day of the week. 
Yeah, yeah, I you actually know, fully agree with you there. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, Andrew Sullivan says Limerick by six. I don't think there's anyone out there saying Kilkenny by six. Stranger things have happened. We could be completely wrong on that front. But uh, we'll move on now to the other Munster semi-final of the weekend. We're, I'm not a biased man, but you know, it, it's hard not to talk about how Tip are back. Will this be the weekend when Tip are back again? I tell you what, uh, so I hope some people don't think that that's your Tipperary jersey at number two on it. Just to be it's clear, it's that, that, that's your that's your brother Paddy's jersey that he wore. In, was that the ten final or the nine final? That was the two thousand nine league final. Okay, very good. Okay, um, if it wasn't a tip jersey, I'd say it was a nice jersey. So I I would never wear a tip jersey. No way. Why? What do you no. have against us? No, 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 no. There's we some things. Or there, like, there's really some mean. things. There's some things you just can't do. And for an awfully man to wear a tip jersey, you just no, you couldn't do it. No way. But why is it like in a different province and all? I mean, how many people would you have? I'm literally about two minutes. We have land. We have land. Uh, we're farmers at home. We have land in a place called Riverstown. It's right on the border of Borough and Carrick, and I'm right on the border here. And Ross Gray is only about ten minutes over that way. So no thanks. No, I will have no association with Tip, and I okay. gladly bash them every opportunity. Yeah, because we don't think that way about Offaly because we never have to consider you as a rival. But you're obviously because we've only got <laughs> we've only got four All Irelands and you have whatever you have. It's Kilkenny and Cork. But uh, when you when you're the small man, you have to build up these little rivalries with everybody. Yeah, actually, to be honest, everyone kind of hates Tip. Oh, everyone around us uh, absolutely detests us. But anyway, I'm only messing about Offaly. I think everyone knows that. Um, Michael O'Callaghan, off topic, but do you see the Munster hurling final being played in Croke Park to facilitate larger crowds? That's an interesting one. Obviously, there's going to be 8,000 at Croke Park this weekend, under 10%, obviously a ridiculously low uh, figure, especially when you see the attendances at the Euros and across the world, like 70,000 at the Canelo fight there a few weeks ago. I've obviously made my my point very clear on that, and now you're going to bring that thing up on screen, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I, here's something I prepared a bit earlier. Uh, it says vote John Bracken. I want to tell on to this. John, John Bracken has changed his look a small bit now. Um, this is you know, vote Shane Stapleton independent. <laughs> Whenever the next general election is, I'm expecting a swell of votes in fairness. It's a good poster. It'd be a real collector's item of a poster in fairness. Vote is ideal, yeah. And there's nothing shorter than that's going up on Twitter straight after the show. <laughs> Were you colluding with uh, with our man Michael Callahan who commented there because I absolutely walked myself onto uh, that one. To be honest with you, um, I, I had sent it on to you beforehand and you got a brief look at it and you, you just said listen i'm not bringing that up i'm not bringing up anything to do with that but so one of our uh one of our viewers has thankfully brought it up for me yeah but that's interesting like it, there's only going to be 500 and i mean they talk about it an increase to 500 as if that's something to yeah, be yeah. proud about like it was so ridiculously low for so long at zero then 200 is ridiculously low and now 500 at a place at some of these venues that hold between forty and fifty thousand, Christ Almighty, it's it's ridiculously low. It's an embarrassment. But anyway, that's my point. If you want to get your comment in, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure that they would move it to Croke Park. Maybe they would if they're going to keep the the attendances that limited. Maybe they I would. don't they see have... it. I, I I don't see it, Shane. To be honest with you, I don't. Yeah. See. When, when was the last time Munster final was played outside of Munster, if ever? Jeez, that's an interesting one. Jeez, if anyone knows the answer to that, let us know. Obviously, Jeez, the that... Munster yeah. replay was in Turles a couple of years ago. I'd be amazed. Obviously, the Ulster football finals were played in Crop, moved to Crop Park for mm. basically to facilitate more spectators when uh, when Armagh played Tyrone a couple of times. But uh, just, I'd be amazed if the Munster final has been played. You know, when you have Limerick, Cork, uh, Turles, you have all these you know real good grounds. I, I'd be amazed if the, it was ever played outside of Munster. To be honest, yeah, with you. even like. In, in like in the grounds you've named, it's it's even rare that it goes as far as uh, Kerry these days. Obviously, mm. Fitzgerald Stadium has has uh, hosted them in the past. Donald Farrell, I hear Prince Harry is going to sponsor the Tip Team next year, and Jennifer Lopez is going to do a copy <laughs> of the Galtee <laughs> Mountain. <laughs> Wouldn't mind hearing that a little uh, remix there with J Lo. Okay, let's get into the match itself because uh, Liam Sheedy is he fighting against public opinion by picking the older players? Like he's kind of asked. To some degree about this, that he's still using players that made their debuts in 08, 9, 10, all this talk of it being a young man's game. And uh, he goes, the guy that starts, whether he is 21 or 31 or whatever age he is, that will be based on the data I've seen over the last number of months right in front of my eyes. And that allow allows me to sleep very easy at night, to be honest with you. So, but it, like even just, I, I t certainly take that at face value. I don't think he's just going to pick some older player just because he's got a long running relationship with him and that they're friends or whatever. 
it must be down to the data. But do you think he is uh, pull, pushing against uh, public opinion by continuing to pick those older players? I don't think so, Shane. I think like when when is change good? Change is good when change is needed and their the personnel is there to come in to replace these. And the players you're talking about replacing are will go down as some of the greatest players of their generation. Uh, you know, Potty Marr, Brendan Marr, Noel McGrath, Seamus Callanan. These guys will go down as, you know, some of the best hurlers of their generation. So, like, they have a 20 All-Ireland and they have a under-21 All-Ireland. But, like, I, I'm not sure. You know, there's a couple of, la- obviously, outstanding players in those teams. But say the, the 21 All-Ireland winning team. Like that was, that was more a sum of its parts kind of a job, if you know what I mean. Like there weren't a load, there weren't a load of really, really obvious future tip senior stars there. You look at the the twenty one, the twenty win, then the year after. Um, I think Jake Morris was on that, was he? Uh, like so, Jake, yeah. like he, he's From obviously, Cal- he, yeah, he's Darcy. obviously, he's obviously, uh, Jake Morris is obviously in the equation for the weekend, um, and maybe you know. Of some of the other playing, younger players that would be a Paddy Cadell as well. But you, you can't just, you don't just replace players for the sake of it. If he still thinks they're producing and he's seeing training games every, you know, every second or third night and he's seeing, okay, he's obviously seeing that Paddy Matter is matching up well against this guy and Brendan Matter is matching up well against this guy and Jamie Cannon is matching up well against this guy and they're, da- they're doing well against their younger opponents. So, like, you're not just going to throw lads in for the sake of it, and you're not just going to throw lads, young lads in, just because people think you should. He's, 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 as he said, he's operating on what he sees before his eyes every couple of nights. If these young lads are really standing up and staking a claim, I'd imagine they would play. And I think that's the same anywhere. Um, I don't think it's a, a trust thing or that he knows exactly what he's going to get from these senior players. I think, well, that comes into it as well. He does know what he's going to get from them. But he's obviously seen enough from them in the here and now. You know, you, you always say, you know, what have you done for me recently? They've obviously done enough for him recently and they're obviously doing more than the other well, that's Michael Verney gone again. Well, just even to pick up that point about Tipperary and the, the performance against Watford was obviously very disappointing in terms of the scoreline because Watford were a few points behind and ultimately Tipperary got uh, spanked in the second half and it finished up 229 to Watford, 321 to Tipperary. And even just to flesh that out into the amount of scores that were had in the game, 31 scores to 24. That would be worrying from a Tipperary point of view, but they did look very dead on their feet. And as the game went on, it seemed like they only got worse. I'm talking, Michael Verney, about the uh, league game when Tipperary kind of finished so disappointingly. And that took probably a lot of the gloss off what had been a fairly decent campaign before that. Like, Tipperary finished third overall, but they did win. They won two games and drew one game. Um, obviously lost, or sorry, they drew two games, they won two games, and they only lost one. So really, is, is there, are there alarm bells ringing? You've drawn with Limerick, who have routinely been beating you in the last couple of years. In games that have mattered, I'm going to take that dead rubber 2019 out of the equation. Drew with Cork, obviously that was a decent game. They beat Galway, can't sniff at that. Westmead, I think that was expected enough victory there. And then losing to Watford, when you know that Watford need to peak a week or two early, but then of course the way they performed against Clare would make you think that would actually paint Tipperary in a slightly worse um, light. But you'd imagine Tipperary were going through some very, very heavy training that once it got to a stage of the league where they knew that Waterford and Westmead left, they just said, forget results. It doesn't really matter what happens here if we finish top of the league group. We're going to train hard now. We're probably not going to be as good as we were in the previous games. But, you know, to hell with it and just target the Munster semi-final. Yeah, I think there was, I think going back, like there was a clear distinction between league and championship in 2019. Remember, like tip up at about five gears for championship in 2019 after a pretty bad league, having only kind of really delivered a good performance against Cork. I, I think all that, all that would have mattered to them was hitting the ground running in championship. And I do expect to, to see a completely different team than we, than we saw against against Waterford the last day. Uh, they were through a heavy, a heavy training block at the time, and I, like even the the subs and bubbles in particular, they they did a fair training session after in Walsh Park. They must have been out there. We were the reporters were just finishing off our work, and they must have been out there for about 35, 40 minutes. Even bubbles was doing extra running after with uh, the rest and Seaman and Carbro Carillon as well. So like, I do think I do. I'm expecting a, a completely different Tipperary outside of that Waterford game as well. 
I think it would you would have considered it a quite a good league for Tipperary. Mm. Learned an awful lot. Uh, I think particularly defensively, they were solid at the. The only game where they weren't solid at the back was that Waterford game. And as you say, you don't know they could they could have just written off that game before they started. But before that, they'd been very very solid. Uh, no goal conceded against Limerick. No goal conceded against Galway. Really tight. Um, scoring a lot from out the field because maybe they didn't have uh, they didn't have maybe Callan in the full forward line. Someone as a real focal point on the edge of the square, and they were happy to score from out the pitch. Um, but yeah, I'm expecting a different different tip proposition at the weekend. A um, couple of real interesting things like you know who marks Tony Kelly in every game is always going to be a, a big debate. Brendan Matter was the designated man marker in, in 19 and was absolutely flawless at it really. He was mm. even in even in the Munster final when Galan went to town he was brilliant on him that day. Is that who you would expect to pick up Kelly uh, at the weekend? Yeah probably but I suppose you'd have to say like he was really good at that job but Clare couldn't get a foothold anywhere in that game and Tipperary won by, was it 14 points off the top of my head? But it was a very, very handy win for a finish. I remember that day, Barry Heffernan, he started full back and John Conlon, obviously, and that'll tell you how different the teams are now that Conlon is centre back. And we'll probably talk about how will Tip look to to maybe exploit that, even though the Conlon Lara man was, was man of the match last weekend against Waterford, and rightly so. I, I could make a case for Brendan Maher just being started on him again because if you know something has worked or you've had a certain amount of success with something, you're probably going to stick with it again. And then, like, I don't think Brendan necessarily minds too much if he has to mark him full back or whether he has to mark That's him. The thing. Yeah. It's not like Caleb Lines. He can play anywhere between two and seven and eight and nine on him. And he could actually hurt Claire going forward if Kelly is out the pitch. Yeah, that's a fair point. Like, he'd have no problem hurling you any which way. Thing is, like, if you were to go at it a different way and Kelly played inside and you said, right, maybe we'll put Cahill Barrett on him. And Claire are obviously going to try and create a lot of space and get ball into him there. I don't think that, like, I think Barrett can hurl and probably play centre back a nice bit for Holy Cross Bally Cahill. But I don't think Tipperary would want to take him out of the full back line. So having him as a designated man marker, no matter where he goes, I don't think that would necessarily work out. And obviously, Barrett had a tough time he was left exposed against Desi Hutchinson the last day in the league he probably want to stay back where he is mark a man whether that's I don't know maybe Ian Galvin if he plays in there whether Aid McCarthy moves in like Aaron Shanner against Paddy Maher seems like it'd be a natural enough fit but like you could have Brendan on him in the half back line and Kyle Barrett if he goes inside but I'd say Brendan would just stay with him all the time and if that means Barry Heffernan moves out to the half back line you know maybe he'll start in the full back line it kind of remains to be seen to some degree, and look at like I'm looking at the at the way the the Clare team lined out the last day. Aidan McCarthy, he was wing forward. Obviously, Tony Kelly was in the corner, but it was Aidan McCarthy, David Reedy, Ryan Taylor inside, and obviously buzzing around. Ian Galvin was trying to kind of maybe dropping out a nice bit. Aaron Shanahan and Tony Kelly inside. So the natural matchups to me are Paddy Maher against Aaron Shanahan, and Aaron Shanahan was brilliant at winning the ball last weekend. It was just. His striking just kind of let him down a nice bit. Will Kelly play inside? Do you do you see Kelly playing inside here? Uh, probably not. No, probably not because I don't think it's. Uh, I think they realised that they were creating a bit of a mismatch by putting lines in their last day, and that, that was going to take a lot away from Waterford. I don't think it takes anything away from Tipperary to have Brendan Matter in there. The only thing I will say is that if they did have a two man full forward line and the tip two man full back line was Brendan Matter and Paddy Matter potentially maybe they would think that they could do them for toe in there. That's that's the only thing I will say. That's for what toe. I do, yeah. That's what sorry, that's horse racing terms. Yeah. Horse racing terminology. He was done for toe he was done for toe a furlong from home. Um, <laughs> like but uh Barrett Barrett will like if it's a two man full full back line, Barrett will be in there, you'd imagine. Because mm. he just offers so much uh from a covering point of view as well. Despite what Dublin's fair city says, he does offer an off he does offer so much in there. Yeah, no. so then we are kind of, we've talked ourselves around and not so, so maybe there are opportunities to, to upset Tipperary a little bit because if you if the tip full back line is Brendan Maher and Paddy Maher, two guys who are 31 or so, and there's lots of space and good ball going in against two young bulls like Tony Kelly, as we've kind of ranked the best hurler in Ireland right now, and Aaron Shanahan, who's some man to win ball, and then you've Aidan McCarthy, David Reedy, Ian Gavin, Ryan Taylor trying to run off their shoulder. There, there's plenty for Tip to worry about. There definitely is. And like we talked about the last day, it was a four-point hammering against Waterford. If if Clare, you know, cut the wide tally down to about 10 or 12 
and they're able to get away those eight or nine shots and get scores out of them, they could put up a massive, massive tally. So mm. that's, that's I think that's going to be really interesting from a defensive point of view. Interesting to see where Barry Heffernan comes into it as well. Has generally been a designated man marker uh, on one of the opposition forwards' most dangerous, uh, the most dangerous players. Uh, not sure, not sure where he comes into. It. Could he potentially drop drop back in on in on on Shannon as well? Obviously, strong in the air too. Would be able to stay with him um, for tall, as I say. It's going to be it'd be, inter- be interesting to see there because. He he usually does pick up like he picked up Connor Whelan, um he, he picked up Joe Canning last year in the All Ireland quarter final. He do, do does generally uh pick up one of the opposition's most uh, most dangerous players. Yeah, like I think I probably said this to you before. I think Barry Heffernan is now one of Tipperary's most important players. He's at that perfect age now, where he's physically developed. He has the experience and like he's just a powerhouse of an athlete and he's got great hurling and when he comes out with the ball he doesn't get sent backwards which is what happens to you a little bit as you get become an older player you're no longer just bursting through that first tackle you've been sent the other way and then all of a sudden you're leaning back and trying to strike and clear the ball so i i just think he's a massive player and his absence last year for some of those games early on the championship especially against limerick was so keenly felt as it was with seamus kendy so this is one of the big things that Tipper, like, think about the match last year against Limerick when when uh, when the Premier started out their season. It was down in Cork in the depths of winter, rotten rain, lots of injuries. Paddy Maher had a, a knee injury coming into it. As I said, Barry Heffern and Seamus Kendi, they weren't available. Even John Maher had been drafted in from the footballers and just thrown in at the deep end. Very tough day for him. Dan McCormick wasn't started. Michael Breen, who you know didn't have a great game the last day against Watford, he wasn't started. This is a Tipperary team that'll be very different coming into this now. They've had a nice training block for a few weeks, while other teams have probably been focused a little bit more on, like Watford obviously was the big focus of Brian Lowe in the last couple of weeks. I think Tipperary come into this game now, some are sad. You know, I, I, I really think Tip have no excuse here now. Everyone's probably carrying an injury or two somewhere along the lines. But in general, they have most of the players they want. The likes of Paddy Cadell has gotten more game time. They've tried some of the younger players in the league. This is where I'm on Liam Sheedy's side. They've tried plenty of the younger lads in the forward line, especially during the league, and they haven't really impressed. You know, let's call a spade a spade. They're going to need a little bit more time. We won't start naming out players, but they haven't really impressed. But I think Tipperary, if they come out with fire in their belly, and this is often the thing with Tipperary, you know after five minutes whether you're going to see a performance or not because are, are they in the faces of the opposition? We'll know very quickly here if Tipperary are. I think if Tipperary come out with fire, they do win this game. And I'm not saying, I, I think Clare are improving all the time and better than we probably thought early in the year. But I think Tipperary have enough for to not necessarily be up for debate in the last five minutes, ten minutes. No, I tend to agree with you, Shane. But honestly, it's funny. Like I, I did tip Waterford to get to the Munster final before anything started, and I, I do think Waterford is the sort of team that uh, that could have really, uh, could have really struggled or you know made Tipperary struggle somewhat, like they did in the league game, just for the pace that they have. But uh, I, I do see, I do see Tip in a different proposition. Um, since they, they did, they did enough in the league to to impress and I do expect it to go up another gear. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Hickey, if Claire run the ball past the tip half tip half back line, tip will struggle. I think Aidan McCarthy is ready to explode. Uh I think he was being roared at for probably hitting one way too many the last day, but some of his performances in the league and just you can see athletically this lad is like he's he's a serious machine and he's got scores and Cahill Malone at midfield, we've kind of talked about him I think I'd, I'd love to have if it was ever over a team, you'd love to have a few Carl Malones. Yeah, he's just yeah. so honest. He works so hard. Generally, his hurling has come on an awful lot too. He do, he always does the right thing with the ball now and can take a score now. I think he's so, such an unsung player. Yeah, Derek McGrath and Anthony Daly were talking earlier in the week about how Brian Lowen was listening to the players at the end of, of last season, which was uh, year one for him. And he goes, it's a powerful bit of management. Some managers would have thrown the toys out of the pram and said, you won't dictate to me what way we go about this. I think it's a massive sign. It shows that you're vulnerable. Put your hand up and say, I'm vulnerable on things, lads. I might, I might bring a whole pile of positives, but I have things to learn at this level. And to take guidance from John Conlon and Tony Kelly, Cahill Malone, you can imagine the leaders there. And that's true. I mean... Brian Lowen hadn't managed at this level before. Of course, he'd been involved with clubs. I think he was with Cratlow and UL. But you do have to listen to your players. Like, you're not going to know it all on day one. And, like, especially when Brian Lohan is fighting such a battle with the county board, the people above him, like, he wants people that are, you know, ostensibly above him to listen down a tier. I mean, 
he's obviously smart enough to know, well, in my job and what I'm trying to achieve, I have to listen to the lads who are, you know, kind of underneath me too. So uh, fair play to him if that is the case. It's a funny one, Shane. I'm sure you've had plenty of managers. God knows I've had them tell you exactly where to go uh, unceremoniously, tell you where to go if you try to give them any advice on anything. Um, ah, but the best ones do listen. I mean, they yeah, are full game with their players. Yeah. The, the best because... ones, really, I think, Shane, that in life in general even, you should you should always be willing to take uh, an opinion on board. You never know who you might pick up something from. And I've noticed that a lot in recent years. Someone that could say something to you, even I'd be out selling lotto back when the pubs were open uh, on a Saturday night and someone could say something to you about hurling. Someone that you didn't even think knew anything about hurling. You'd be like, Jesse he kind of has a point there. I don't think you should ever write off anyone's opinion. In particular, those players that, that Derek mentioned there, the experience that they bring to the table. And like, Brian Lowen has finished hurling a long time and the modern nuances of the game and like the game is so different now. You, you could have played a club game two years ago and you go and play a club game now and the tactics being used are just so different. So in order, those players have their finger on the pulse. So you use their, you know, information, you use their knowledge for your team to prosper. I think it's an absolute no brainer. So yeah. fair play to them. But I do, there would have been a lot of old school managers that just tell you four words followed by three or four letters followed by three letters. And they could say <laughs> to you, they'd be fairly definitive about it. Is the second word off? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, a point from Mega JW99. Not sure about that. Dow Conlon said hello and put me centre back lead. I don't think that, I think it's more they would have had a talk about how modern hurling is. Because like if you're a manager or a spectator, you look out in the field and you see in one thing, but sometimes you're out in the field and the way things are moving around you and, and, and whatever's happening, that feels very, very different. You don't learn till you're in the maelstrom of it all and you start to figure out, okay, this is actually what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it. Um, another point is uh, James O'Connor, what he was talking about, what Lohan is facing, <clears throat> and obviously the county board challenges and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he was talking about my wife, you know, the resources that it takes, you know, and what the rivals have that are that are also pushing for titles. He goes, um, James, he said, my wife's an accountant and Brian asked her to come on board as treasurer of Club Clare. I see firsthand some of the challenges that he's had and he's having to do things that I don't think Liam Sheedy or John Kiley or Brian Cody are having to worry about. Just trying to give the Clare players a chance to compete and to have what any player wants, which is to feel that you have the best chance possible. And that's a challenge for Brian in the current environment. And the fact that he's gone and beaten Waterford, now I'm sure over the years Waterford would feel like they could have better resources and what have you. You know, he's he's obviously doing a great job. But is is there somewhat a better um, complexion been put on this on this Clare team because they faced a fairly poor Waterford challenge last week, a team that looked pretty flat? And I suspect Tip won't be flat in this game. Yeah, but as I said, like Clare should have beaten him out the gate. Like that should have been ten or twelve points. So. Uh, it should have been far more comprehensive than it was, regardless of the challenge that was thrown up to them. But yeah, as I I do agree with you. I expect and a lot of a lot of fire from Tipperary. You'll know pretty early. But I'd be amazed if I'd be amazed if Tipperary don't show up with a lot of bite at the uh, at the weekend. They have to like this is it. Like how long more is Sheedy going to be be in charge really as well? Like I don't expect him to stay for a big long second stint or anything like that. I, I that's just my personal opinion anyway. And um, yeah, I, I'm expecting an awful lot, uh, an awful lot from Tipperary at the weekend. I saw Andrew Sullivan commented, commented in there every day as a school day. He'd be a good friend of mine. That's literally, I think, that's that's literally my motto in life. There's never, there's never a day or a moment where you can't pick up some sort of information. And fair play, fair play to Brian Lone because I don't know about you, I would have had it in my head maybe that that uh, he mightn't be the most approachable. That's just my own personal opinion from what, from what I've seen. He definitely wasn't approachable as a full-back anyway, I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. he's definitely, he's definitely um, proved uh, that he can adapt to modern times as a manager anyway. Yeah, Brian White, lads, three of the four big hurling games this weekend are on Sky Sports. That's very poor for people, especially with the lack of crowds at matches. Do you know what it's going to do? It's going to end up that you know we're not allowing people to congregate outdoors in the numbers that we should. People are going to be indoors in each other's houses, mixing together. Well done on the advice we're getting from the leadership in this country. <laughs> you named it again. Drop, drop that uh, election poster there again, will you, for the crack? <laughs> He's at it again. This is like a, it's like a rally, Shane Stapleton rally. Well, look, are the people going to back me if I run? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I think I could go with that hairstyle yet. It's not bad. I kind of went more the other uh, direction recently. Okay, so I think we're both going to go with Tipperary to win that. There's a few other games, as I said, uh, were brought to you by Bamboo, uh, the, the new Hurley from Torpy. Get 10% off with the promo code our game. The, the link to their website is in the video description. And if you want to get this on Patreon, the audio podcast, that's the only place you'll get them, patreon.com forward slash our game. And if you want any help with your club, fundraisers this year get on to us at events at our game.ie so we'll move on to the joe mcdonough cup this weekend if carlo win they're in the final they're against westmead uh, after beating kildare last weekend 222 to 316 this is a huge opportunity massive opportunity uh, for carlo for tom malally they're playing in consecutive weeks uh, but they're missing marty Kavanagh. he's he's out for the rest of the campaign and might even struggle to get back for for st mullins is for the carlo senior hurling championship he ruptured his medial ligament in his knee. Now, usually, usually a medial ligament uh, strain in your knee might only be six weeks or two months. But if he's ruptured, if he's ruptured that ligament, he's going to be out for at least mm. three months and may have to may have to go under the knife. But it is a massive opportunity for them. They they, uh, they obviously beat Carroll last weekend. If they win this weekend, they're in the final. Um, it'll be three games to win the McDonough. Be huge. Uh, I know from chatting a couple of lads down in Carlow. Uh, they'd nearly be happier to be in the Westmead position of three weeks since they played league, chance to rest up, chance to get lads back on the pitch. You know, Killian Doyle had an injury and did a couple of more. I know David Glennon is, was injured and not sure of his status at the moment. But that's a really interesting game. Westmead are the favourites for the, the McDonough Cup. But if they lose this weekend, their campaign is over before it started. So these are like high stakes games. Are Westmead rightly favourites though? I mean, after the league campaign they went through, like even in their group last year, they they, they finished ahead of Carlo, all right, but they didn't get through. Antrim and Kerry got through their group last year. Are they rightly favourites considering some of the beatings they've taken? Confidence must be low. Sometimes you can have a default favour, can't you? Just because yeah. it's, it's like Kerry aren't going well, um, Carlo are missing Mouse Cabinet, so all of a sudden they're left as, as default favourites, in my opinion. They're probably still on paper marginally the best the best team in it, but um, I'm glad to see John Hoare is voting at the Saint number one. God above, you never know. This could be some sort of social media movement. You just you just never know. Yeah, if yeah. if you end up if you end up in the draw, I tell you, it'd be some crack. I tell you, a bit of competence, no harm to throw that in there. Don't <laughs> the Monster Hurling Championship trophy is now called the Mackey Cup. No way anyone has taken off Limerick. 2,400 in Semple Stadium on Saturday should be 15,000. Will Kylie pull any rabbits out of the hat this year in terms of player positioning? I think Nash may well get the nod ahead of English in the corner. On Vernie's uh, point about good opinions and insight, do you think you might explain why so many great managers were not incredible players? Sometimes lesser players need to understand games more. I think that's absolutely the, the case that you have to think about more. You're forced to. I think that's 100%, and I don't think there's any reason, uh, there's no... Um... It's no uh, coincidence that a lot of goalkeepers are really good coaches and managers as well because they're seeing a game completely different and analysing it a lot different as well. They're seeing everything. Uh, if you're playing centre-back or wing forward or whatever, you mightn't see as much. But I do I do get that. Like, say, in soccer, like, I know he's not exactly uh, flavour of the month now at the moment, but say, like, Mourinho was, a, you know, an average enough player. Obviously, Benitez. Benitez, Benitez yeah. Um, I, I do... T I, I tell you what I think it forces you to do. Uh, it forces you to really try and extract the best out of yourself, even as a player, and start looking at things a bit differently, how you can get edges, how you can get percentages, uh, benefits over other lads. And then all of a sudden you take that into management and you're able to get more out of players because you. some people are naturally talented, don't, maybe don't have to work as hard as some others. When you're, you know, when you're poor, when you're maybe not great or you're poor, you have to get every little edge you can and then you can bring that to a team as well. Maybe analyse things a little differently as well. Yeah, yeah. So Downer against Mead as well. Down, uh, they need to win this after losing to Kerry. Um, do you think Mead are coming in a little bit cold? They haven't had it, they obviously haven't played for a few weeks. They're definitely coming in cold. Their only league win, I think, was in their last game against Wicklow. Um, they're obviously a reasonably high-profile ticket there. Nick Weir is manager. Uh, Timmy Hammersley, who obviously was part of the tip panel in 2010 uh, when the one all Ireland is involved, and uh, Johnny Enright from Tip is involved as well. They had a really disappointing league. Um, I definitely would be favouring down here. Down won the, the corresponding league fixture quite comprehensively. But the nature of the McDonough, this, this group is done and dusted already. Kerry, Kerry beat down last week. And very, very hard to see Mead beating Kerry when they play. 
So it looks like Kerry have one foot in the final already. It's really kind of taking a look at the other side. And uh, and if Carlo come in this weekend, they'll be in the final against Kerry. So it'll be interesting. Uh, it, but it's a weird kind of competition just because they're trying to cut down the amount of games they're playing. Like, basically, you know, one side is over after one game, which is not really, not really great because you want to maintain interest till the very, very end. Yeah, you'd like to have seen a slightly different setup here, but... Uh... You know, that's the way things are. The Christy Ring Cup, Ross Commoner against Derry this weekend, and also the Christy Ring playoff, Sligo against Offaly. So, uh, Ross Common, Derry, and then also, like, this is the first time, actually, you were saying that Sligo and Offaly have ever met in competitive hurling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Parik Ferguson from GA Lore gave me some really interesting stats on uh, teams that haven't played each other in championship, and this is one of the few that's left... Sligo have never met Offaly in any type of competitive uh, league or championship match. Uh, it's the first it's again, without being disrespectful to Sligo, I hope it's the last time they, have, they ever play each other. And I hope we're on the an upward trajectory. Um, like uh, based on based on league form, there's this is this should be nothing only a, a comprehensive win for Offaly. I, it's hard to see anything else. Uh, no major injuries coming out of the league or any, anything like that, to the best of my knowledge. On the other side, then Roscommon and Derry, Roscommon. Uh, were beaten by uh, Wicklow last week. And Wicklow said beaten well. Up. Yeah, they were beaten by ten points. They only hit one eleven, um, and I'd imagine they're going to struggle against Derry. Derry looked like the uh, Derry looked strong on that other side, and would probably be fancying themselves to to get through to the final and avoid awfully potentially until the final. Yeah. Then in the Nicky Racker Cup, Mayo are against Leitrim this weekend after Mayo's win over Donegal last week, and in the Nicky Racker playoff. Armagh against Tyrone. So, um, yeah, like Mayo have themselves in a good spot at the moment. They definitely do, yeah. They beat uh, beat Donegal last week. That was a repeat of the, the Nicky Racker Cup final from last year. Key Higgins was was good. He got 1-3. He was kind of the, the difference maker, really. Um, Armand, Armand, Tyrone will be interesting as well. Tyrone put big scores during the league. Um, there's so many games this weekend, like even the Laurie Maher as well. Louder nearly out of Laurie Maher already. They're the defending champions. They were beaten last week. Uh, they were comprehensively beaten. It was, I think, it was eight twenty-five put up against them last week. They're playing Mana, who are obviously, yeah. yeah, who are obviously managed by uh, fantasy hurling guru Carl McIrlane. So, uh, and I tipped Mana for <laughs> to to win the Laurie Bar. So no pressure on you there, Carl. And then the other side of it, then Cavan against Fermanagh. And I know you've got a few boys, uh, a few mates playing with Cavan as well. So you've the inside scoop there. I haven't been a training this week, so I haven't actually even met them. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm expecting big things from Brian Fitzgerald this week. I want to see him putting up a nice scoreline against uh, Fermanagh. And I don't want them to all be freeze either. We'll put it yeah, that way. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And hey, and a big, a big one for you as well. The 2020 delayed Leinster minor final, Kilkenny against Offaly. Yeah, that would be a huge boost to get a win there. Oh, geez, it would, yeah. The, the minor footballers were beaten last night by a point to a mead, which was a bit of a heartbreak. It was the first time we were in minor finals in both codes since 89 and uh, won, won the two of them in 89 and the hurlers went on to win the All-Ireland with Brian Whelan and uh, Johnny Dooley amongst, the, amongst that team. So, yeah, it's a, mass, a massive game. I have a, I'll have a nice little interesting story for you on Monday. Uh, doing something special there at half-time of this this final. Um, with your lady friend? You no, showed him no. with me. Not at all. No, no, no. This is something more GA kind of special. They're going to rewrite a bit of history at half time of this game, but I'll have a, I'll have more details for you on Monday. Yeah, I don't even think you'd have enough romance to even propose that half time. It wouldn't imagine exactly for, be the most. I know, not being smart. Proposing a, a match now. You know, what? Hur, hurling means an awful lot to me, but you kind of have to think of the other person involved. In <laughs> fairness, would you? I wouldn't say it's something you're great at doing. All right, that's <laughs> it for the hurling show. Brought to you by Bamboo the New Hurley from Torpy. Will uh, everyone enjoy the matches at the weekend? Keep the comments in, and uh, we'll chat to you at the far side of the weekend, Michael. Cheers, Shane. The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time, without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code OURGAME to get yourself 10% off.